Ugh, I don't want to go to work today. Don't want to go to work today. Hold on a minute. Wait a second. I actually have a pretty awesome job. I'm a talk show host. I forgot about that. I love it. Let's, uh, let's, let's do this. Let's activate talk show host mode. Boom. Boom. We are in talk show host mode. Talk show host mode. I got my new tweed jacket. I got my clothes. It's my daytime look. I'm ready to put on a show. Now, before I put on a show, you know, I got to have my coffee every day. Got to start with my quad shot. I also like just to show off my wonderful kitchen. Let's get my, oh, let's have some toast. I'm gonna make my coffee while the toast is, is cooking. Cooking? Do you cook toast? I guess technically you do. Ah. Oh. All right, I have my toast. All right, I'm ready. I hope you all are. Let's go do a talk show. from the island of Kauai, it's Animal Talking. Today, join Gary and his guests, video game legend Jordan Mechner and best-selling author Hugh Howie. And now, because none of us can leave our homes, here's your host, Gary Witta. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, what a, what a, what a, what a warm up, what an opening, what an opening. Adam, good morning. Good morning. How are you, sir? I'm all right, I just heard something really amazing. What a way to start the week. What a way to start the week. If you, uh, if you were listening to that intro, you'll know that uh, we now have a, uh, a hype man, an official hype man to do our um, intros. And he um, absolutely, uh, just absolutely killed it. Just absolutely oh, yeah. killed it. Right? That was that was amazing. And I'm sure it many of you... sounded I'm, familiar. It sounded familiar. If you listen, if you're plugged into the Twitch world, if you're plugged into the gaming world, you will have recognized the voice. The one and only inimitable voice. And we were very lucky to get him because he's very much in demand these days. The number one hype man in the business. Snowbike Mike. <laughs> just amazing. Just amazing. And he absolutely killed it with that intro. Now, before I forget, I do want to go over here because I like I like our little and I, I got to move this. I got to move this. Uh, Why? I, I, I got to move that jukebox because it, it won't let me mess with it without turning on, turn the light on. I'm going to move it so it's not under that light. Driving me crazy. Every time. <laughs> But I do like it. I like how look, KK, KK Slider, of course, provides the uh, background music for the show. Um, and this is KK Jazz, one of my favorite albums, a little bit of smooth jazz. It's the perfect, it's the perfect talk show vibe, Adam. As, as, our, as our lead band leader, wouldn't you agree? Uh, most definitely, although I thought you didn't like jazz. I, don't, I usually don't like jazz, but I like KK Slider. So I Fair. like KK Slider more than I dislike jazz. So it's all good. Um, we are getting better at this, Adam. I, it's funny, I, I was talking about this last night. Like, it's only, the show's barely a week old. And already, already, I um, I can't even look at that pilot episode anymore. Because it was great, and Naomi, our first guest, was great. But it's so rough now compared to the super slick high-level production values we're now bringing, bringing to you. At no cost, by the way. <laughs> oh, most definitely. Right? You hearing me on this? Um, speaking of music... Um, I've got some really, really exciting news to relate uh, to you all here on the show. Um, as you may know, if you've been watching the show every week or every day or however long we've been on for the, for the last seven or eight days, uh, we have this incredible theme music that you just heard at the top of the show. And I found it on you back, you know, a week ago when we were just noodling around in the basement and they just wanted a piece of placeholder music. I found this amazing piece of music on, on uh, YouTube and it was composed by a guy called Kenny Fong. And Kenny also performs lead saxophone on that piece. And we've been using it all week. And the whole week I've been reaching, we've been trying to reach out to Kenny, trying to, uh, trying to get him. 
Leah, our executive producer, and my wife actually tracked down every single member of Kenny's band in hopes of reaching him because we really wanted to talk to him and like be able to officially use the music on the show. And I'm happy to announce, Adam, you're going to like this. I'm going to get you in the shot here because I, I think I, I think this is only only you, you're going to want to see this. You want I, I want to see you react. That's right. I'm happy to announce live on the show this morning that as of yesterday, uh, Kenny and I spoke, and he has granted us uh, an official license and permission. Uh, to use his music on the show any which way we like. So we now, the, the, we, the, this is now the official, official animal talking, uh, official animal talking theme music, and we're going to get to keep using oh, it amazing. going forward. And I was really, I was really, I was, I was really nervous. Like if Kenny didn't want me to use it, or if he wanted like a million dollars or something, like we were going to go have to find something else. But and I really like this piece. And not only I've got, I've got some, I've got some news for you now. You know this, Adam. You already knew this. But I've got some news for you that you don't know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna Ooh. drop it I'm gonna drop it for you uh, right on the right on the show. Um, not only did Kenny give us permission to use the theme music, he also provided us you know this part of course also provided us with a new high bit higher bit rate higher quality version of the theme music directly from his studio that we now use on the show. So this is not like the YouTube version. This is like the higher quality version. And that's the version we debuted that today on the show with Snowbike Mike's voice over it. And Mike, by the way, is going to be doing all the hype man intros for the show going forward. We've signed him up officially, locked him into an official contract. He can't get out of it. He can't get out of it. <laughs> and here's the new and here's the new news because I just got this email from Kenny like 10 minutes before we, we went live. Kenny is putting the band back together. He's getting all the original members of the band who performed that track, and they're going to come perform it live on the show. Oh, that is incredible. Can you believe that's going to happen? Yeah, because that was 2014. 2014, they composed that track. And, uh, but we're going to get... So, so Kenny basically said to me, like, I'm happy, to, happy for you to use it, because he's a perfectionist, he's a musician. He's an artist like me, and you, Adam. Um, he said, I think I can do oh, it better. Yeah. I, I might want to re-record it and make it better and give you a new version. And I said, that's fantastic. We would love that. But also you should come and perform on the show. So that's going to happen. That's, that's all happening. Uh, and we're very excited about that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use the opportunity here to be a bit naughty. Well, not naughty. It's my show. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I, whatever I want on this show. Um, <laughs> I, mean, within re within, I mean, within reason, like, you know, uh, I, I, I actually now that I now that I can think now I think about it, there's actually a lot of things I can think think of that we that I, I can't do on this show. Um, yeah, I imagine you just had some of those thoughts. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you may know this, Adam, that some time ago uh, ba um, I um, published a uh, an original uh, comic book called Oliver. Oh yes, which is kind of like a weird futuristic retelling of the Oliver Twist story, and we put it out uh, through. Um, Image Comics late last year we did the first few episodes uh, first few issues I should say co-created with Derek Robertson who also co-created Transmetropolitan and Happy and The Boys and all these big hit comics I know right I mean, we should get Derek on the show and um, and we put the comic out we did the first four issues it's been a big hit but now of course publication is kind of on hold because no comic stores are open there are, no, there are no new comic books coming out right now but one of the things that Image Comics did which is really nice is during the coronavirus they lowered the prices on all of their comics, uh, on Comixology for digital, you know, because you can still read comics digitally. They're just not coming out, you know, in the sh in the shops. Um, yeah. But you can now go. So I, you know, everyone comes on this show and plugs their stuff on my show. Adam, I'm going to plug something on my own on this show. You can now go get my original comic book, Oliver, from Comixology. The first issue is get this, Adam. The first issue is free. It's free. And the other issues, the other three issues, are only ninety nine cents. And in fact, there's the link. Nano's way ahead of me. I'm. Um, uh, you should probably do my link because uh, my one goes to the actual whole series, not just the page. But either way, um, five new subs already on the channel today. Uh, the hype train is going. Uh, go click that Comixology link. You can check out the first issue of Oliver for free. And if you like it, the others are only 99 cents. And the, and the, and the remaining issues in the series, there's going to be 12 eventually, uh, will be back. Are they only available digitally? No, you can get them in comic shops or order. You just can't go to a comic shop right now. But you could order print copies. Of um, I'm just letting you know that Comixology has this crazy deal right now for the digital uh, versions. Um, so go click on so that free. link. Go click on that link in the chat. The first issue is free. And I'm so excited about that. I'm going to post the link yet again. You can read that, that for is free incredible. on your iPad, on your laptop, whatever. And then the other issues are only 99 cents. And that's actually true, I believe, across like a whole range of Image Comics books, not just all of us. So you can go check that out. Uh, so I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, we have a packed show today. Uh, I'm very excited about that. But before we get to that, Adam, I'm going to ask you, of course, it's Monday. 
uh, yesterday, Daisy May was doing the rounds. Are you in the turnip market this week? I am indeed. You are? How, much, how, how heavily invested are you? So I decided I almost took a week off because I was so busy baking banana bread. But I decided to just go with one load of turnips. I thought you had a problem with that word load. I thought it was it was freaking you out. You didn't want to talk about. I loads do, but anymore. we never we never decided on a solution. All right. Well, I guess we'll just keep using it until someone tells us to stop. Um, yeah, I bought <laughs> I bought three hundred seventy four thousand or three hundred seventy two thousand dollars bells, I should say, worth of um, uh, turnips yesterday, and I'm anxiously awaiting that first great sell price. I'm putting I'm putting I'm putting the sig the bat signal out there now, Adam. If you're in the chat, if you've got an amazing price on your island, five hundred bells or more. Let me know. I'll come to. The, I'll grace your island with a celebrity appearance. I'll sell my turnips, and then I'll get the hell out of there. You know the other. You have thing a pretty I, terrible price today, don't you? Uh, I think it's awful. Yeah, I'm gonna have. I, I, I've actually never sold turnips on my own island. I've always had to go to someone else's. <laughs> but that's what you got to do to, to get the, to max out the best price. Um, the one, the one other thing I wanted to mention, Adam, just a small change, but uh, so people who are like really, you know, sticklers for detail may notice we have a new couch on the set. I'm gonna go try Ooh. it out. This is this new. It's the same couch, but just in a different color. Uh, our prop master, Leah B. Jackson. Um, well, she and she works with the other Leah, my wife, to kind of get all the props and the wardrobe for the show. Um, we picked. A, we, she sent me this couch in every single color it's available in, in the game. So right now we have a yellow couch. Tomorrow night we might have a red one or a blue one. You just don't know. I'm going to keep you guessing. You just don't know what's going to happen on this show. Well, and it was good because you let the people tuning into uh, Animal Crossing Mornings decide on uh, what couch color you should go with. Right. That's that, that that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, the other thing um, I want to point out, I want to do one more thing before we bring today's guests on. Don't forget, today on the show, we're going to be joined in just a moment by Jordan Mechner, the legendary, legendary, I tell you, creator of Prince of Persia, is going to be on the show very, very soon. And then right after him, we're going to have Hugh Howie, New York Times bestselling author, will be on the show as well. This is probably, I don't know if it's the funniest show we're ever going to do, but it's probably going to be the smartest. I'm very aware of the fact that in about 10 minutes, I'm going to be by far the least intelligent person in the room. I, pr I think yeah, I probably should already, I leave? Well, no, I think I probably already am. But like in 10 minutes, it's going to be beyond down. Just, I mean, th these guys are very, very smart people. Um, speaking of guests, before we uh, get on with it, there's one other little thing I want to announce. Um, it's very important to me that the show, we keep it real here on the show, that, we no that we're not letting it get out of control. I, the people I want to have on the show, I'm less concerned about how famous you are and more concerned about whether or not I just kind of feel like you're cool, you know? I just want cool people first and famous people second. Fortunately, on, on Wednesday night's show, we have a show, a new live show coming up Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Um, I'm very pleased to announce this was just confirmed. And I promise you this isn't a joke. This is 100% real. Uh, on Wednesday night's show, uh, we're going to have a really, really cool show. Um, and I'm going to give you a little preview of it right now. On Wednesday night's show, we are going to be joined. Um, as you know, Adam, you know, we're starting this little YouTube chat. Where the episodes are going out on Twitch. They're going out on YouTube. You know, we're a little channel. We're not really that big. We're not, we're not at like the epic, you know, we're like, we're not at like I Justine levels of like, you know, YouTube fame. We're never going to get no, to that. Of course level, not. Right. That's ridiculous. No. Um, but maybe we can get some advice because on Wednesday night's show, um, I Justine is going to be here. Legendary YouTuber. One of the all time, one of the great pioneers of YouTube streaming and Twitch streaming. I Justine is going to join us here on the show Wednesday night. She's going to be here with Mike Krahulik and Jerry Holkins from Penny Arcade are going to be here on the couch. And Kinda Funny's Joey Noel is going to be here on the couch Wednesday night, 7 p.m. It's all happening. It's all happening. That is going to be a packed show. I'm going to have to figure out how to get a second couch onto the set or something because we can't sit. We're going to have four guests on the show. I'm going to have, we're going to have oh, to man. rearrange this set. This is, a, this is a new challenge that we've never um, dealt with before. So We can make it work. We'll figure it out. We'll do, we'll do, we'll do some moving around uh, and, we'll, and we will make it work. So that's Wednesday night, 7 p.m. I, Justine, is going to be coming to the show talking about streaming and tech and all kinds of cool stuff, what she does on YouTube. The Penny Arcade guys, I love them. They're going to be here. Uh, and Joey from Kind of Funny uh, are all uh, going to be here. And that is going to be, I think, pretty damn amazing. Um, that is going to be a great show. But let's let's get on with the show. Let me get behind the desk. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What, hang what, on. what, what, what? Oh, There's no, wait. There's one other thing you forgot. There's one other. Look I'm actually, your beautiful I'm actually, I new know, suit. I know. Oh, wait, hold on. There's actually two other things I've forgotten about. I do want to, I do want to, um, you're going to see two new, two new, na two new uh, names in the credits. And while I do this, our first celebrity guest is getting themselves into position right now, ready to make their grand entrance. Uh, but while he <laughs> does that, um, 
I do I do want to thank you're going to see two new cre- two new names in the credits uh, on this show um, going forward. One is obviously Snowbike Mike, he's our hype man, and the other one is um, our stylist, our new uh, celebrity stylist, uh, Kate Stark is um, uh, uh, has been sending me all these beautiful tweed jackets and suits and giving me uh, fashion advice. And as you can see, I'm looking looking very, very fancy right now. Um, and that's uh, largely thanks to Kate, who actually, this very jacket that I'm wearing right now, uh, she provided this. And we're gonna, I feel like this is a good, like the black suit, the blue suit, I feel like that's a nice night, uh, late night look. But for the daytime show, the morning show, you know, I feel like this is a good look. You know, the, it's a bit more, it's still smart. It still says talk show to me, but it's a little more casual, you know? Yeah, and to, to make it very clear to the audience, you're not kidding. You guys sat on the couch. Oh my looking, god! Yeah, we did the whole you thing. were trying on we streamed suits it. for yeah. ages. We streamed it. <laughs> now, Adam, I'm going to come over here for this next part because I want to talk to you about something. Okay. Now, something happened last night that I want to talk to you about in the prep for the show. I was prepping for the show. I, I you know, like, I want to. I, it's very important to me that the show go well, so I do a lot of preparation. I was up late Sunday night last night working on all this, and. I just want to tell this a lot of a lot of wrong things have happened on this show a lot of mistakes a lot of bad things have happened on this show many of them have been my fault some of them <laughs> i would say most of them the vast majority of them have been my you know going to the wrong scene you know playing music when it shouldn't be played all kinds of i've done all kinds of horrible mistakes how many like you know i've gone back up the stairs and redone the intro because i've screwed it up i i own almost all the mistakes on the show so far and oh my god do, and, and all i can do is try you know where this is going don't you yeah, I finally made a mistake in your. So, and then, well, hold me. on. And then, and then, and then there are things that happen on the show through no fault of anyone's. Like when the stream crashed, that wasn't anyone's fault. But then finally, last night on the show, we had a major situation, a major panic, and it was all your fault. Hang on. So there was only a major panic before you talked to me? No, there was a major panic during talking to you as well until we figured it out. Well, it was still only you majorly panicking. <laughs> Well, there were, okay, I'm going to tell the story and I'm going to let the chat decide. I'm going to let the audience decide what they think is, is the scenario here. Um, so I was playing around with Streamlabs last night. You know, we got this new intro from Snowbike Mike. We got this new music file from Kenny Fong and you mixed it together and you made it sound great. You gave me the new music file. Everything was good. And I was testing mm-hmm. it out, just doing my dry run, doing my dress rehearsal, making sure it's, it's all working out. Um, and after the intro played, everything was great. But then after about a minute of streaming on Streamlabs, it cut to a black a black screen like i lost complete i lost the capture card uh, input <laughs> right but i'm looking over and that's happened before like the capture card has failed on me it won't get a signal from the switch i had to drag a second uh capture card out from my junk drawer an old one that i had to get that's actually what i'm using right now because the, the old capture card is is not that reliable the newer one's actually not as reliable as the old one i'm using the older one again. but but i'm but i'm looking at the other as last night i'm looking at the other i'm looking at the capture card screen and i can see the capture card is working i can see the talk show set on the capture card just not on streamlabs mm-hmm. and it would just black out and i couldn't figure it out it was driving me crazy i thought you know what I'm not going to do what I always do. I'm not going to go crying to Adam right away to fit. I'm going to figure this out. And I spent about 20 minutes trying. I, 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 I reconnected the capture card. I got a different HDMI cable. I did all this stuff. I, I troubleshooted everything I could think of. And I could not get the image back. It was just a blank, a black frame on the screen. And I finally, like when I was done, I finally texted you and said, look, can you jump in the Discord? And you jumped in and we diagnosed it for a bit. And I finally, I actually finally figured out what it was. I was like, hold on a second. It's this goddamn intro. Adam, is there something weird about this intro that you, this new intro you sent me? And what happened was, Adam went back and looked at it. And when he, basically, when he replaced the, the theme song, the, oh, cause the, the music and the animation is all one thing. That the sound file and the animated logo, that's all one thing. And when Adam swapped out the old YouTube version of the theme song with the new cleaner one that we got from Kenny, as it turns out, the new version of the theme was one millisecond longer than the old theme. And what happens is the Animal Talking logo you see up on the top corner there, that's the final frame of the animation. When the animation stops playing, it just stays on that card. But when Adam swapped it out for the new, the new frame, the new theme song, which was one millisecond longer, the final frame was, you guessed it, a solid black frame. So that, in fact, what was going on, we got a new version of the intro where Adam cut out the black frame. But Adam, you, with, I know you don't mean to because you're a very nice person, but you last night caused me major, major agita. Like, I was, I was freaking out. I thought, the sh- I thought we weren't going to be able to do the show. To be fair, it does not take much 
to make you freak out. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I, I feel like that was worthy of a freak out. It was a, it was a problem that that made it un, un made me unable to do the show, and which I could not diagnose in the first thirty minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. You know what? I, I was gonna do a poll, but I'm not because I feel like the poll, I feel like the audience is gonna come down on your side, and I don't want that. So yeah, yeah. You, I'm gonna, look, were you gonna I'm, do a poll that says is Gary overreacting? No. It, um. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And everyone's gonna gang up on me because I'm the host. I get it. I'm the I'm the butt of the jokes. That's fine. That's my job here. <laughs> all right. Listen, we've kept him. We've kept him waiting long enough. We're 25 minutes into the show already, and it's just all been nonsense. So let's get on with some like real actual. Uh, quality uh, content on the show uh, with our first guest. Um, this is a guy who's been a good friend of mine for many years from my work in the video game industry. He is a stone cold legend in the video game industry. If there's a video game hall of fame, he belongs in it. He's created many, many classic video games over the years. He's one of the all time most famous, most celebrated game designers in the world. Uh, most notably, most famous uh, for creating the legendary the legendary Prince of Persia. Please welcome to the show, my first guest and good friend, Jordan Mechner. There he is. Come on in, Jordan. Come take, a, come take a seat on the couch. Come take a seat on the couch. You can do it, just walk right, just walk right into the couch. There you go. Now I know I now, there's no need to practice social distancing on this show, Jordan. You can sit close to me in that. That's yeah, the whole I'm, point of this show. Yes, I can hear you. I'm a little shell shocked. This is the first time I've been in anybody else's house in two months. Yeah, right. It feels weird to be out of the house, doesn't it? It's, it's great. I have to say how impressed I am with your studio too. Uh, isn't it amazing? Like the the best compliment that I've received is when we had Mike Drucker on the show, and Mike used to work for the Real Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. And he said, this is like being back in my old job. And that was amazing. Jordan, I'm serious. Get off the couch and come sit close to me. You're freaking me out. All right. Get over here. You can do it. Where are you going? Go. Oop. What is going on? Hang on. My daughter is stepping in to help me here. Okay. All right. All right. Get on that. Okay. Well, there we go. That's, I, th I guess that's close <laughs> enough. That's, that's as good as we're gonna get. You wanna try again? You wanna try a little bit closer? Try again. All right, just keep pushing into the couch and you will, you will event, there you go. There you go. You got it, okay. you got it. Well done. Okay. Oh, now I'm out of your seat, hold on. I wanna, I want I wanted, to I wanted to my... applaud you for sitting on the couch oh, correctly. And uh, shout out to my daughter, Jane, who helped me sit down just now. Everything I am <laughs> and everything that I have in Animal Crossing uh, is thanks to her. It's only a matter of time before you're so old she's helping you do that in real life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I hear that your daughter also helped dress you and style you for the show today, is that right? Dressed me and styled me. And by the way, she was also, uh, Gary, when we visited your, uh, your studio and your green room yesterday, kind of prowled around your house and your garden a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very impressed. I mean, it's, I'm easy to impress, but she was really impressed and... Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. I put a lot of effort into my house. Uh, you know, everyone plays Animal Crossing differently. Like, you know, Leah likes to have a beautiful island and she's put a lot of thought into landscaping her island and it looks wonderful. Uh, I put most thought into my house and I really like to have a beautiful house. And I've said it a million times. If I, if I ever become super rich, I'm going to give this game to an architect and say, build me this house. I want the Iwood furniture. I want it all. Wait, wait, Gary, when you say when I become super rich, that's like hearing Bill Gates say when I become super rich. Like what? I Look, what constitutes Animal Crossing wealth in your mind? Well, Animal Crossing wealth is well. In Animal Crossing, I'm a very rich man. In Animal Crossing, okay, I'm okay. In, in in Animal Crossing, I am very much the man I want to be, but I am not. Look at that. I mean, I've got this. I'm handsome. I've got this beautiful hair. I'm well dressed. I'm super rich. I'm not any of those things in real life. So this is why I play the game because I want. I, I don't want to be me. I want to be this guy. You know, I've been doing interviews all week with uh, various outlets. And uh, they want to do Zoom calls. And when I do the Zoom call, I don't use the camera. I, I use screen share and I do it as the talk show character. <laughs> which they, which they, kind of find, they, they kind of find funny. So Jordan, thank you so much for joining us. So honestly, I'm really, really pleased oh, to have you on the show. Really, okay, really so happy let's, to be. Let's, let's, get, let's get into this interview. I want to talk to you. Um, I want to, I, and you've made many games. And I'm sure you get sick of being asked about it because it is obviously your most famous game. But since you have a book to plug about it, I, I imagine you're not going to uh, uh, be, be too bothered talking. I'd mean, be happy to talk to me. I want to talk to you about Prince of Persia. It is your most famous game. It is your crowning achievement. I want you to take me all the way back to the beginning of, of your life 
and career as a um, uh, video game uh, maker. Like, what, what, like what, what was your early life like in terms of video games? And what, like, what were you playing? And at what point did you start to kind of develop the aspirations to make your own video games? Well, we'd have to rewind all the way back to Space Invaders, I'd say. Because uh, you are truly old school, right? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm truly old. <laughs> you know, when, I was a, when I was a kid, we didn't have video games yet. So, uh, you know, when Space Invaders came along in the arcades and replaced pinball, like, that was cool. That was new. And so when the Apple II came along and uh, created the possibility to actually play games at home, you know, I, I was already, uh, I was through most of my childhood. So I was in high school when I started programming my first games you know, on the Apple. And, uh, and, what were the, and what were those first games like? Oh gosh, well, my first games were in basic, uh, but the first really ambitious game was uh, what we call at the time a clone, uh, you know, a knockoff of Asteroids. Okay. In 1980, uh, so I spent a good six months programming my first uh, assembly language high-res game that was a pretty close copy of the arcade asteroids uh, but unfortunately we couldn't get it published because uh, that was right about the time that atari's lawyers figured out that this was going on and cracked down on it but that's not that's um, not an uncommon thing to kind of learn to program like like take a simple game that you, and, and try to replicate it right yeah i mean asteroids wasn't that simple it was uh <laughs> that, that, that was sort of, i'd sort of been making games for about three or four years at that time that was 19. 80, 81. And, um, um, and then what was the, and, the, and then, the, but then the first real thing that you made that we know and heard of is, um, is uh, yeah, was... Karateka or Karate. First of all, I know you sent me a whole video on it, but just, let's just get this out of the way. How do you pronounce it? Give me the correct pronunciation because I'm, I'm sure I've been getting it wrong all my life. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I'm getting it wrong too. Should we play the video? It's, uh... Is there a video about the making, about the pronunciation? You sent me that video, right? Let me see if I've got it. If yeah, yeah, got no, no, I've got it right here. Uh, I know, but I, but, I, but I need it in order to in order to play it on this end. So I want to paste something. it into the chat. Does that work? Oh, yeah, yeah, paste paste it into the chat so that people um, can see it for themselves. But also, okay, here's the video. Let's see if this is a real thing. Um, okay, this is 54 seconds long, um, and I'm going to uh, run this video right now. And let's um, let's see if uh, hold on. I need to pull up my capture card as well. Just bear with me for one second. Sorry, just one second. I. I am getting better at this, but I'm still a little bit slow. Uh, we're going to run a quick clip that Jordan has brought. And uh, this is how you officially pronounce the name. And I'm not even going to say it because I know I'm going to get it wrong one more, one more time. This is how you officially pronounce the name uh, of his first big hit game. Here we go. Let's roll Let's roll the clip. So I grew up with this game. Uh, me and my brother had the Atari 800. And so we installed it on, on that computer. And so I grew up my whole life calling it Karataka. Okay. Um, I pronounce it Karataka, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Well, I pronounce it Karateka. I don't know why. Let's talk about pronunciation. So here's the thing. In the 80s, TV didn't talk about games, and we didn't have the internet. So pretty much everybody pronounced the title of the game in their own way. A lot of people say Karateka or Karateka. Uh, in Japanese, uh, there's no stress on any syllable, so it would be Karateka, something like that. I called it Karateka, but I've since found out that pretty much everybody pronounced it differently. So however you pronounce it is fine. Don't feel bad. It's all good. Okay, so I so I don't actually need to feel bad. I don't know. I, I say Karateka, but nobody else does. So But I feel like the way that you pronounce it should be the official way that to, for it to be pronounced. You know what I mean? Well, we, we could try to start a movement. So you say Karateka. I, I now say, oh, you know what we could do? We could do a song. You say Karateka. I say Karateka. Let's call the whole thing off. That works for me. I really got to get that. I really got to get that cricket sound, Adam, for my soundboard for when these jokes don't go over. Because it happens all the time. I feel like the best thing you can do as a comedian, the best thing you can do is when a joke doesn't go over, turn the fact that it didn't go over into a joke. Like that's all you can do. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna. That's a skill set I'm gonna have to develop uh, going forward. I think. So Jordan, let's talk about. Let's talk about Prince of Persia. That's the game I want to talk about. That's the game that is currently back in the news because you have this amazing book out uh, and I really want to talk about it. Let's talk about Prince of Persia. So you made Karateka and um, then you wanted to make take the next step. What was the genesis of, of Prince of Persia? Can you trace it back to like one light bulb moment? What was the, what was the very beginning of, of the creation of Prince of Persia? Sure, well, it was a lot of things. I mean, Karateka came out when I was uh, in college and you know, I've been playing games like Load Runner, Choplifter on the Apple II. And uh, there was a game called Castles of Dr. Creep on the Commodore 64, which was, I have to say, one of the main inspirations for Prince of Persia because you were kind of running around, hitting switches and opening gates. It was a puzzle game. You know, you weren't just like mindlessly 
uh, beating enemies. And so I, I thought if I could take that kind of modular puzzle platform game structure and combine it with smooth, fluid animation like in Karateka, that would be cool. So that was one inspiration. And then the other one came from seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981. You know, right. the first 10 minutes where Indiana Jones is like running, jumping, he misses the ledge, he grabs on with his fingertips, he pulls himself up, the gate is closing. I felt like that was a video game scene right there, but it was done, you know, real, like he could get hurt. Right. So to sort of that kind of flesh and blood feeling, like because when a load runner character, you know, or Mario jumped off the ledge, he just kind of floated to the ground. So I thought it's a game where you, it would really feel like if you jumped too far, if you missed the ledge, you could grab on, if you fell too far, you could die. That, that was the idea. So just those two things, sort of mashed together. And then with the idea of a kind of a Persian Thousand and One Nights exotic setting. Right, right. And then um, you got into it and I know that you you were doing some pretty crazy stuff back in uh, that no one else was doing. Like you had your brother running around so you could get a, and filming him so you could get a sense of like uh, how a character moves. Because one of the things that really struck me when I first played Prince of Persia was, as you said, the character moves in this incredibly like, almost like a motion capture kind of way, but before motion capture existed. So how did you take that footage of your brother kind of doing, you know, kind of uh, parkour in a parking lot or whatever, and taking that and turning it into the animation that impressed everyone so much when they saw it in the game? Yeah, well, the problem was that when I tried to animate uh, like out of my head, it just looked kind of clunky. And, uh, you know, the character didn't seem to have any weight or momentum. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I could draw somewhat, but I wasn't uh, an animator by any stretch. So I used a technique called rotoscoping. Uh, and uh, my brother, as you mentioned, uh, did volunteer. You know, the price was right. And the parking lot across the street from our high school was available. And so, you know, we took a video camera, which was a new technology at that time, 1985, and uh, just spent an hour shooting in profile, the moves that I thought this character might need for the game. Actually, we have another little video here. Which Jordan, is... you're so, I, I love the fact that you're like basically doing my job for me. It's like you, 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 you cue, not only do you bring the clips, you cue them up. Like you make, you make my job so easy. Thank well, you so you know, much. You, you, know, you provided uh, the clothes, you know, you did so much. It's... The only, the only thing that I, um, that I, that I don't like when someone does that is like, I kind of like saying, and I understand you brought a clip because it feels like a very kind of talk show <laughs> thing to say. So I'm going to say anyway, Jordan, I understand you brought a clip. Uh, yeah. And oh, look, here it is in the <laughs> Animal Talking Cat channel. All right. So. I'm going to mute the capture card so that the jukebox doesn't play over the clip. And here's a little here's a little clip that Jordan put together. Uh, just this like a minute or so. Actually, this one we can actually talk over because it doesn't really have much let's, in the way let's, sound. let's talk over it. I like that. Um, and we're going to we're going to run the clip right now. Right. So this was a question that was asked by somebody on Twitter. And so that it was such a good question that I had to create a video to to answer it so this is my brother uh doing the the climb up so you can sort of see the difference between the climb up in the game and, and the reference footage that we shot the question is was it hard to climb up on a ledge from a dead hang now there you see he made it so that was in 85 and then uh, once i started programming the game i realized that i needed more footage so i brought him back but by now as you can see he he gained about six inches and uh yeah, he still couldn't climb up onto the ledge. Jeez. So, so this is like the enhanced movement as we had it in the game. God, this is taking me back. Yeah, but that's my brother there. It's just uh, <laughs> now he forgot to take his jacket off. I love it. Off. I love it. That is so. That is so cool, and it, and it gives me incredible memories as well. Now, the fact that now, you there's other video. Sorry, the other video that uh, Adam was about to play could actually play now too because that's kind of a that's sort of like a trailer for the book. Yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm That's I'm going to do. Stop running the show for me, Jordan. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. I'm, I, I, I really appreciate the help, but I've got this. Well, I mean, you, you might not think that because I keep making mistakes, but I, I think I've got this. Give me a second. You want to, we're gonna, we are going to show the trailer for the book. But first of all, I just wanted to ask you, like, so getting that footage of your brother running and jumping around is very impressive. And it's amazing to see, like, how, you know, what you shot on video became the footage in the game but like this is before anything like performance capture or motion capture existed right and you were taking that and just using it reference for you then hand animate these characters right well it was a little more uh rube goldberg than that tell me uh, tell me about it okay so step one was that video footage that you just saw so the trouble is that there was no video input on the apple II or anything like that right right so uh, uh, but there was it was actually a company in the uk created a plug-in card yeah, I think they probably sold about five of them total, but I bought one of them and uh, you could plug a video camera into it and you could capture one still image, kind of like a, 
You could only capture high contrast, like you could get the difference between black and white, but anything in between, you know, shades of gray didn't work so well. Right. So I, I finally worked out a technique, which was I set up a 35 millimeter still camera on a tripod in my living room, drew the shades, and took a picture of a freeze frame of the video. Uh -huh. And then a frame advance, took another picture, frame advance, you know, took another picture. And then I took that roll of you know, 36 exposures down to the local photo mat and got it developed. So that gave me a kind of a series of frames, which I then cut out, scotch taped together, used a black magic marker and white out to silhouette my brother's uh, uh, position in each frame. And so that, you know, after you know, a, a day of work, gave me a, a sheet with 30, you know, with maybe 15 frames of animation per page. And I would then put that on an animation stand, point the video camera at that, run that into the Apple II, and that gave me a capture, which I could then clean up wow. laboriously, pixel by pixel. And, and then and cut out frame. Was, any, was anyone else at the time doing anything like this, or were you basically the pioneer of, of, of that kind of technique? Well, I had done something like that for Karateka, uh, but that was with uh, Super 8 film. So video was actually a big technological step up from 1982 rotoscoping to 1985 right. rotoscoping. Right. The because uh, the only you know, I'm I'm very old school as well or like you said just old and I I used to play you know I, I first played uh, Prince of Persia on I think the Commodore 64 now maybe it was on the Amiga but like you know going back to the 8-bit days when I played the Commodore 64 games the only other game I can think of that did anything like that that kind of animation was Impossible Mission and I don't think they were doing this you know they, they had a character that kind of jumped around and did cool things but I don't think it was it wasn't as good as what you were doing and it's it's to this day I think it's still super impressive. Well, thanks. Well, it it took a long. time time it was uh, there were many times when i uh along the way when i just kind of like now, God, what have i done it <laughs> now jordan you wouldn't be a guest on this show if you didn't have something to plug and i love I, lo I love the fact that i get to talk to you about prince of persia without you know it seeming like i just want to talk about your old stuff because all that is old is new again you have a new book which i think is really really interesting um i want to just ask you about the the, the backstory of this book so what i find fascinating is i like, is that when you made the game not only did you um, do all this crazy stuff with videoing your, your brother and stuff like that, but you, you, you exhaustively, painstakingly journaled and chronicled everything. And you've now taken all of those notes and all of those journals and published them in this really beautiful volume. That's, and we're going to plug it in a moment. We're going to show a little video. But first of all, I just want to ask you, like, were you doing that? Were you creating and, and keeping such um meticulous records of everything just because that's like you like you're a bit ocd or was it because you were feeling like people this is kind of cool and people are going to want to know how i did this one day it's a good question i started keeping a journal uh freshman year in college and i kept journals before like you know in junior high and high school but i would always end by throwing the journal out you know at the end of the summer or whatever saying you know everything i wrote in that journal is so embarrassing and immature you know i don't even want it to exist anymore <laughs> I know how that and, feels. I mean, that's how I feel about yeah. last week's shows. <laughs> there you go, Adam. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Badum, yeah. you gotta, you, those Badum tissues was, are gold. You got to do. I'm going to give you one creative note. Do more of those because they're good. And that's also a good. That's also a good. Like when when I, like one of my jokes. But that's actually funnier when one of my jokes bombs. Like when a joke bombs. Yeah, I'm, I'm but, just yeah. trying to be nice to you and, too. No, and trust me, I'm going to give you plenty of opportunities to to capitalize on my jokes bombing. Plenty. <laughs> Jordan. I'm going to mute the capture card again, and we're going to go over to this uh, little clip. And let's just let this one run. This is just one minute and 16 seconds. It's just a little um, 30. It's just the 30th anniversary uh, of the making of Prince of Persia. And this wonderful new book has come out. And Jordan has made a really cool trailer uh, to show um, uh, what it's all about. So we're going to go over there right now and run this clip.
So I think that's super cool. That's really, really cool. And um, I think it's so cool that I am going to drop the link. There's a, there's a link coming at you. There's a link coming at you that I'm going to drop in the chat right now. We're actually going to show this next. Um, let me get over here to the next uh, little link on a show. Uh, right over here, uh, we have, this is, I, this is the link that I just dropped um, in, the, in, uh, in the chat. This is Jordan's website where you can go get a copy of that book. He sent me a copy of it and it's absolutely beautiful. Like it's hardback. Uh, you know, it just looks like a proper tome that you would want to have on your shelf. And it's just filled with all this fascinating information. Um, and I highly, highly recommend that you get it. If you're in, in any way interested in Prince of Persia or video game development or video game history, um, I just think it's really, really fascinating. And again, that link has just been dropped dropped into the chat. jordanmechner.com slash backstage slash journal is where you can go buy. And then we don't need any Jeff Bezos getting in the middle. You can get it directly from him. Um, and not worry about any kind of middleman. But Jordan, the one thing that I really want to talk about while we're on this page is lay, lower down on the page, there is a phenomenal, phenomenal photograph of you from yeah, you as a young man when you made this, when you made this uh, game. I really want to talk about this image. I really want to talk about this mullet in particular because <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Um, t tell me this, when was this picture taken and, and, and how old were you at this point? Gary, are you sure we can't just stick with my Animal Crossing character, which has like nice, nice hairstyling? I and, might, I might just leave this up for the rest I of the show. Look, I, I, I didn't have my daughter to style me at the time. That's that's, that's true. You I didn't, you, you didn't have your daughter at all. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be nice to you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut away because that, that, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be mean. Uh, but I mean, well, I mean, I mean that, that assumes I don't think you look great in that picture. I, I do. I think you look great. I'm just, you know, as as mullets go, it was, it was correct, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, you would do. I mean, you know, at the time, you were doing it right. You, I mean, you had the polo shirt, you had the mullet. I mean, you look like that's the epitome of like late eighties, like late early nineties video game developer. Like you, I think you pretty much defined that look. I, I was uh, proud of that mullet. The other thing, I <laughs> as wanna, you yeah, should be. The other, the other thing I want to show um, that is really, really cool is um, this other thing that you have now. You live. You actually some some years ago, you actually moved out. You moved away from the U.S. And uh, now you live in uh, Montpellier, France. Is that correct? I, I do. That's where I am right now. That's where you are right now. Even even as he's sitting on the couch, he's actually I'm in San Francisco, and Jordan's actually sitting on the couch uh, from Mont Montpellier, France. And one of the things I love about Jordan, if you follow him on his um, on his uh, on his Twitter, uh, he often posts. Uh, he likes to journal. He likes to sketch, uh, and he's a very very talented artist as as well as on top of anything else. And he he like you know, just sits like sits in you know cafes in france and doodles and you know basically lives lives that life and and jordan you've also taken these sketches um and you've published these right as, as a, you, you, these sketch journals are actually something that, that people can get as well uh, i want to ask you like why like why do you like to doodle and sketch and why did you decide to actually put these in a in a book i guess it's kind of a theme isn't it taking things that i originally meant to just be private and for me and then eventually publishing them in a book right i don't know i, th I think it uh Maybe it comes from the family. You know, my grandfather, uh, when he retired from being a doctor at age 78, he spent his year, first three years of retirement doing a giant family autobiography. So I, th I think this urge to document might be genetic. Yeah, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. So, um, yeah, there's one other thing. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, sketching is something I did as a kid. You know, before the uh, Apple II came along, I was, uh, you know, I liked to draw and do cartoons. And then I pretty much stopped for 20 years. Uh, except for the, you know, the sketches and the graphics of the game. Right. So it was about 10 years ago when I did a graphic novel. I wrote the script for a graphic novel. I did it illustrated, but I worked with these amazing illustrators, uh, Luin Pham and Alex Poubilan. Uh, it's a, like a 480 page book about the Knights Templar. And working with them just kind of gave me the, you know, the urge to start drawing again. And uh, Alex gave me a, uh, you, you know, some blank moleskin notebooks that he'd been using uh, that, that he had, but that he hadn't, uh, you know, had time to draw in because drawing was his day job. And I just started sketching, you know, first started you know, sketching my kids, people in airports, cafes, and just kept it up. And after about 10 years, that kind of became my way of, uh, of keeping a journal, you know, it sort of replaced the old uh, written words journal that I had started keeping in college. By the way, um, we do like to uh, keep the show interactive here. That's one of the big bonuses that we have over, you know, Kimmel and Fallon and Seth Myers and all those losers. Um, we, we, you, you can actually ask our guests questions. 
So what I'm going to do is, uh, don't post them in the chat right now because we're going to get to it in a minute. But like, just if you have a question you'd like to ask Jordan, think about what you might like to ask him. And when I say like now's the time, drop a question in the chat. And if there's one that I like, uh, I'll pass it on and Jordan will answer your question uh, live on the show. But Jordan, again, once again, you've done a brilliant job of anticipating like my next my next topic when you mentioned uh, Templar. Because I do I did want to talk about this. Well, you published a graphic novel uh, a little while ago about the Knights Templar. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go give you just like you like you're breaking the record for like things plugged. On on this show i think this is the third or fourth thing we plugged on the show but i'm happy to do it because it's all such good stuff tell us a little bit about templar oh gosh okay gary it's it's amazing you are a talk show host i, I know uh, what i'm doing i, I, I yeah. you're in good hands here jordan you're going to sell a lot of merch here today don't worry about that right. <laughs> yeah so this is a book that uh that i wrote that uh Lynn and alex illustrated it's kind of an ocean's 11 in the 14th century it's about the knights templar who uh Kind of got rounded up and put into prison on trumped up charges of uh uh you know by the king of france so this is about some of the templars who uh kind of slip between the cracks and what do you do if your skills are as a knight and you don't have a job and you're on the run from the law you you become thieves so right. it's about a band of members who turn thieves and try to steal back the treasure of the Templars that the King of France has stolen from their order. That's that sounds really fun. I've dropped the link in the chat. Go on it between the Prince of Persia book and the sketchbooks and Templar. You can go on a Jordan Mechner shopping spree right out. You can do it right now or, you know, better, better yet after the show. Um, so, Jordan, I want to ask you about kind of like where you're at now. First, like, you're, you're, so why, why, when and why did you decide to move to, I mean, I don't blame you at all, but like, why did you decide to move to France? Well, it was uh, initially for a project and then uh, just uh, liked it a lot and uh, stayed. And how long have you been there now? That's been uh, three, going on four years. Wow. And so uh, are you, yeah, I mean, do you feel like you're there now? Are you ever coming back or do you, are you going to be like a, 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 a French person for the rest of your life? It's kind of hard to see too far into the future these days. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, for the last two months, I haven't uh, haven't left home. I wasn't really no, that's anticipating. that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, the book that you just uh, showed the link to is uh, year two. So the, so I'm now starting on year four. Oh, wow. And yeah, it's starting to feel, uh, you know, I think maybe France is best enjoyed by, uh, you know, you know, by Americans abroad. But it's, uh, for me, it seems it's, uh, it's very pleasant. I really like it here. Um, I love it. And, I, and again, I love the fact that you're sitting here on the couch with me, even, even though you're, even though you're half a world away. And of course, I have to ask you, I asked you a lot about the past. I got to ask you a little bit about the future. Um, how, like, where are you in the games industry? Are you, are you retired? Are you semi-retired? Are you still thinking about games, game ideas? Someone's going to ask it, so I'm just going to get it out of the way right now. Are we, is there, you know, are you still interested in the Prince of Persia universe? Would you ever like to go back to that someday? Uh, but just in general, like, what do you, what do you want to do, like, as a, as a game maker? Are you still interested in making video games? Yeah, I, I can, I can see that you used to be a, a games journalist. That's when did we meet first? Was it 2000? Uh... Na we've we've known each other. We've known each other because yeah, because through PC Gamer, I think I probably first met you either the late nineties or, or the early aughts. I've known you for you know, and I've always I've always been a um, a tough interviewer, uh, Jordan. You know yeah. that I'm always going to like pin you to the wall and demand the the, the, the the hardest scoops. So give it give us a scoop. Give us something like what are you what are, what are you working on? Give us give us a little a little a little glimpse inside the 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 future of, of Jordan Mechner video games. Well, shoot, that's the one thing that thing that's frustrating about the games industry is. We can talk about anything from the past, but we can't talk about anything that we that we're working on now or that hasn't been announced yet. Right. It's so you but you are but you are working on video game projects. You just can't talk about them. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. That's a question that I that I don't answer uh, so many times a day. It's. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we got to start you off 10 a.m. on a Monday. You'll start your week off right, answering questions you really don't yeah, have any interest in answering. Right. All right. No, but listen. No, that's right, right? Because it's, yeah. I mean, to extend, that must be true as a screenwriter too, right? The, the, yes. The things that you're I get about, asked all the time, what am I working on? And I say many things, but I can't tell you about any of them. You know. So we're in the same boat. I get it. We're sometimes you do spirits, Jordan. Sometimes, sometimes I what? I you, sometimes I see you do a tweet like, "Oh my God, I just got off the phone and I'm so excited about something new, but I can't say what it is." Sometimes, and you know what? A lot of creative people do that. I think you're much more disciplined than than most, Jordan, because I I can't help myself. Like I I want to be able to say something. It's so cool. It's so exciting. Like I, you have to like when I when I knew I was doing the Star Wars job, the Rogue One job. It was the better part of a year before I was allowed to tell anyone that I was even doing it, let alone it being like formally announced. 
And when they finally announced it, it was such a relief that it was out there in the world I was working on, but I still couldn't say anything. And then it was like three more years before the movie came out and I could talk about it in any, you know, detail at all. So you know what it's like. You, you, Jordan, you, 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 you empathize, right? You're working on cool stuff. You want to talk about it, but you just cannot do it. And, and Gary, I think I remember actually having, uh, having lunch with you in LA and you not telling me that you were writing Rogue One. That's right. <laughs> I, 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 I not told you that many times. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's if it makes you feel any better, I'm starting a rumor that Gary is rebooting Twins. Oh, that would be good. I would watch that. Oh, God. I'm going to tweet that right now. I like the original <laughs> Twins. Start all the rumors you want. I, that's the problem. Once you're associated with Star Wars, you can't tweet anything, however innocuous, without it being a big deal. You know what? We've kept, we've, we've kept him waiting long enough, and I'm sure he's emerging from the green room as we speak it is time jordan if you would like to make an attempt to kind of get up off the couch and scooch down onto the far end where you were originally that will give um uh, our next guest an opportunity uh to sit uh next to you on the couch and it'll be just like a real talk show you can do it okay. you can do it come back where are you going couch is over here where's he gone where's he gone where's he gone hey, he's over there adam help him oh Oops. you know you know what i was doing i was watching the twitch feed ah yeah i, I told you not to do that you're a few seconds behind the Prince of Persia creator is used to very precise controls. Yeah, it's, got, it's got to be precise. This, this, as a game designer, Jordan, this must drive you crazy. There you go. You got it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You figured it out. Um, let, it's, it's time for my next guest on the show. Jordan's been great, and he's going to stick around. Oh, you know what? I forgot. Wait, Hugh, stand by. Hold your horses. I forgot. It's time for questions from the chat. If you have a question for Jordan... I'll take a couple for him because I do want to get to my next guest. If you have a question for Jordan Mechner, uh, please drop it into the chat now and I will take a look at it. Um, there was one question I saw earlier while we wait for some others to come in. Uh, I think you may have touched on it earlier, but Jordan, uh, someone asked like, what was the original uh, platform for uh, Prince of Persia? I believe I'm right in saying you originally developed it for the Apple II. Is that right? Absolutely. Apple II. And then did it quickly get ported? I, I mean, I, I mean, and now Prince of Persia is just like, I mean, it, it eventually ended up was there ever like a game platform subsequent to that that it wasn't on? It got ported to everything. Yeah. Uh, and this story is actually uh, covered in blow by blow excruciating detail in the <laughs> journals because when it shipped on the Apple II, it was a flop. Nobody bought it. And then wow. uh, the next port was for the PC in 1990. Right. And that was a flop too because it was just a port. And so there was kind of a very discouraging year there or two years where I thought my guy I just spent three years working really hard to make this game I think it's good it's gotten good reviews but nobody knows about it nobody's right. buying it right and what saved it actually a combination of the Mac port which came out in 92 and then a bunch of uh, uh, ports to console systems in Europe and Japan which was it was kind of the wild west then it wasn't like today when everything is sort of a synchronized multi-platform rollout with a marketing campaign these versions just kind of popped up on their own timeline some took longer uh, they were sub-licensed, yeah, there was you know, Domark in the UK, there was uh, there were Nintendo versions, and then just somehow in the combination of all of them, there was a kind of a tipping point, and in 92, uh, the game became a hit, but that was uh, actually more than two years after the first release of the Apple II version. That would not happen today. So it wasn't it wasn't a hit right out of the gate, it took a little while for it to migrate to other platforms before people really picked up on it, is that right? Yeah, two years, almost three years. I got a question from... Um... William, who says he's a big fan all the way from Sweden, um, he says, I've played Prince of Persia pretty much for my whole life. I've managed to, uh, I managed to finish it for the first time ever just two years ago. How do you uh -oh. remember, Jordan? How do you remember the general reception regarding the difficulty of the game back in the day? Because it was a very difficult game. How was, how was that received? Well, feedback came in by mail, right, by the Postal Service. So, you know, sometimes I would get... Uh, or rather, Broderbund would get letters and tech support, and now and then they would pass it on to me. And sometimes somebody would say, you know, the game was very hard, but I finally beat it. Or, you know, they'd have suggestions. But a lot of times, you know, they were seven or eight years old, too. So you had to factor that in. Right. Yeah, we didn't I'm really have the real time. Uh, yeah. I mean, people, I mean, people, I mean, nowadays, hardcore gamers are always complaining that games aren't hard enough. So maybe, I don't know if today it would be better received in terms of the difficulty level. I would say I have more complaints about <clears throat> being too hard than being too easy. And that's sort of the tendency of us game developers, right? Because by the time you've played the game, you know, how many thousand times to find bugs and fix them, it becomes so easy that you sort of have the false impression that it's easy for everyone. So right, right. You, then you make it a little harder 
and then you feel like it's just about right, but then nobody else can play it. I've got one. I'm going to take one more question from the chat, and then I'm going to ask you. I want to ask you just briefly about Animal Crossing, and then we'll bring on our next um, guest. Um, Thunderbrain2002 asks the question: Out of all the console ports, and I'm just going to open this to out of all the ports, out of all the versions of the original Prince of Persia, which is your favorite? I'm sure. I'm sure you have like a special place in your heart for the Apple II version, but that was the because that was the original. Like I said, I discovered it on the Amiga. Do you, looking back, is there a version of the original game that you think like is like the best expression, the best execution of the game? Yeah, I, I think the Amiga and the PC are versions are very similar. Right? Same graphics, same sound. Uh, so I would say be a tie between the Amiga and PC. I mean, to me, those were superior to the Apple version that they had much better sound, you know, more colors, better graphics. My dad, who composed the music, was finally able to do multi-voice harmonies and instrumentation. Whereas the music and sound on the Apple II sounded kind of like beeps and farts, you know, coming out of that tiny little speaker. Right, right. Koshiro has more of a comment than a question, but he says, Prince of Persia inspired Tomb Raider, which inspired Zelda Ocarina of Time. It's an interesting point. Do you feel like, you know, obviously Prince of Persia has been tremendously um, successful in its own right. It's, you know, it's a franchise that I'm sure is going to continue to go and go, you know, through multiple generations to come. But do you often think about that? Do you think about like the wider legacy of Prince of Persia, like the cultural impact it's had on other game designers and other games that have been inspired by it? Not really. I mean, Zelda is amazing. Uh, Breath of the Wild is certainly my, you know, my favorite game of the last few years. I mean, the one that just personally, it's just, uh, you know, that's just the exactly the zone that I love to play in. But I, I kind of feel like it was, you know, just as Prince of Persia was inspired by other games, it's sort of like part of an ongoing conversation. You know, like we're all inspired by the games that we've played up till that point, and then you know, then other games come along and you know take themes further. And I want to ask you before we bring on our next guest, just because we, you know, if, if, if our guests play Animal Crossing, and most of them do, I always like to ask them. So I know you're just getting started and your daughter, Jane, has been helping you with it. Uh, she helped dress you. Um, but, you know, you, you're you brand new to Animal Crossing. Do you like the game? Can you see yourself playing it? Do you do you, do you understand? Like, obviously, it's a game that has phenomenal appeal right now. Like, what is, what is your... Um, looking at it from kind of from a professional perspective as a games designer, uh, does the appeal of this game make sense to you? Like, what do you, what do you think about the Animal Crossing phenomenon in general? Oh, absolutely! It's completely delightful. I actually played it a bit a few years ago on the Nintendo DS. New Leaf? No, wait. Which one was New Leaf? City Folk? No, sorry. Um, DS was City Folk, wasn't it? Or no, Wild Animal World? Crossing. Yeah, but they, they all have like different names. Yeah. I'm thinking which one it yeah. was. Yeah, it was, it was New Leaf. New Leaf. Okay. Yeah, so I mean the controls are a little different, so uh, that's why I have a hard time sitting on a couch. But uh, but yeah, I totally get the appeal, and just the fact that I sleep in a tent, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll upgrade to a house before too long. Demonic Demonic Horde Two in the chat says, "Wouldn't using camera mode be easier for framing this?" And I shouldn't call this out, but I can't help myself. I've had that comment so many times now. Trust me, I've, I, I it's not like I didn't think of it. I thought of it. The camera mode doesn't work. It puts a big crosshair up on the screen. It adds additional um, uh, furniture on the screen that I don't want. The camera movement's very, very clumsy. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I've tried. We have come up with- uh, Gary. Really... Yes, Adam. I'm getting annoyed. Can you have tell? Have you tried the camera app? Oh, you can't put Wait, your Zen the music on the in here, can what's you? What's the saddest emote I have? There you go. I'm going to have this sad frown on my face now for the rest of the game. The rest of the show. Um, I'm sorry, Hugh. <laughs> it's time for my next guest. He is a New York Times best-selling author. He has written some amazing books like Wool and Sand and Beacon 23. He's also a guy that just has a really, really interesting life um, and has a and, and he's one probably one of the smartest people that I get back up the stairs. <laughs> I was just about to say he's one of the smartest people I know, and he's coming down the stairs before I I told him when he's, what his cue was. His cue is when I say his name, and he's jumped the gun. Why do people keep doing this? <laughs> Leah did it. Mary Kish did it. Get, I'm telling you, you. <laughs> Don't mess with my show. He's messing with me, Adam. I will cut to a clip. <laughs> Hugh's now the third person to mess up that entrance. Please welcome. Uh, yes, Adam. I was going to say, it looks like we're out of time. <laughs> Yeah, let's just cut the show. You should do that. If you blow your entrance, you just bump, you just bumped off the show. That's what we should do. He's de like, he's de he's deliberately annoying me now. He's deliberately annoying me. Please welcome to the show my next guest, Hugh Howard. <laughs> Can I, 
Can I sit with Jordan's son? I'm like watching yeah. him get up and down. Yeah, just, 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 just like push his... onto the couch and you will sit down, I promise. There you go. There you go. Alright, uh, Hugh. I'm gonna try and put everything behind because this has got off to a very your appearance on this show has got off to a very bad start. And I, but I want to put all that behind us. I want I want to move I want to move forward. I don't want to look back. The entrance, the outfit, everything. So first, first of all, I've got to, first of all I've just I've just got to ask you what what are you wearing? What is this outfit that you've chosen to wear on the show? What just what is the, what what are you trying to accomplish here? I was you left me in the green room so long that this happened. You, you've turned green basically. Yeah, like uh, like melted into my outfit. I had a great outfit on before I went in there. Now this oh. is um, the first thing I put on. It trips my girlfriend out every time she sees me playing the game. She's like, "What in the world? You're actually I usually look crazier than this. I usually have on um, an eye mask and a pacifier." So, oh god, I, we I, did, I dressed I mean, up a little more. We've had some people uh, come on the show with some pretty crazy outfits, and we've got uh, more to come. Adam, we were just saying to Leah last night. I really kind of hope that the show um, doesn't implode. Uh, before Halloween, because I would love to do a Halloween special. I do have a baby romper I can send you here. Oh, I mean, we're building out. This... We, we, we basically buy everything in Able Sisters every day now because we're building out our wardrobe department. My hair looks pretty much like this ever since quarantine. <laughs> hey, where there's a fill says the camera app allows you to pan left to better frame everyone. That's a good idea, Adam. Why didn't have I think of that? Have you tried the camera app? Maybe I should try it. What do you think? Gary has the Zen music piped directly into his head. Oh yeah. These days. Do you want me to? Do you want me to play it? I will. <laughs> I, I, I have this music that I play when Animal and when I have this other show, Animal Crossing Mornings, and every time Animal Crossing's inter user interface drives me insane, I have a little button, um, and it helps me. <laughs> I have another one as well in case I get tired of that one. You're, you're so lucky I didn't have anything else on my schedule today. Aren't you? Aren't you lucky? I've just I've got you. Like this is the great thing about coronavirus. If there is a great thing, I mean like, that's the quote that comes out of this show. Right? This is the great thing about coronavirus. The great thing about trying to do this show during this time is I say to these top celebrity. Like, I, like, I talked to I Justine, who's coming on the show. I said, "What are you doing Wednesday night?" She said, "Nothing." Like everyone else. So I was like, yeah. "Okay, great, come on the show." And I don't think I don't think in any normal time. We would have got a big celebrity like I Justine, or indeed you and Jordan. You're basically only here because you've got nothing better to do right yeah, now. Yeah, you definitely would have got me. I'll tell you two things I don't like about quarantining so far. Um, one is I realize now that I will never learn how to play the guitar because if I'm not going to do it now, yeah, never, you're I'm never, never going to do, do it. it. Right. Like I have the guitar, I have the videos, I have everything I need to learn. I just never had the time, and I'm still not doing it. So I'm I'm really giving up on that that dream. And the other thing is now when I call my friends and they don't pick up, I know they're ignoring me. I used to be able to pretend right. like in, they're in a meeting, they're in the middle of they're in a, a noisy restaurant, and now I'm like, nah, they just don't want to talk to me. So the thing that the, I'll tell you the thing that I I'll tell, I'll tell you the thing that I like least about the thing that I miss the most about quarantine is I really miss that that endorphin rush that I get from making plans and then canceling them. I love that. I like I, I make plans. I instantly regret it. I spend all week thinking about how am I going to get out of it, and then I just say, you know what, I'm not doing it. And then when I, when I, I say when I cancel them, I'm just so excited. <laughs> I think we needed to go back to, and I like when you get invited to do something and then um, it it falls apart. You don't have to go, but you had the invite anyway. So I think we need to go back to like inviting people to do stuff, all knowing it's tongue in cheek and we're not actually going right. to do the thing. Right. But then we have the thrill of being invited by your friends, you know. Are you getting sucked so, into a lot of this Zoom stuff, though? Are you doing a lot of Zoom social interaction? Because that's 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 what everyone's up to right now. Uh, no, I don't want anyone to see how I actually look. I'm living through avatars right now. Well, that's that's why this so. show is perfect for you. Exactly. Same for me. I don't want anyone to look at me, and no one, and frankly, no one wants to either. Um, Gary, this is the only way I want to hang out with you. This is this is what we're gonna we're gonna have especially, you back on the show. You're gonna be a regular guest on the show, Hugh. Can, especially in your basement. I, no, I want to be the guy that never makes it onto the show. I was begging you to like have it run long and and maybe the uh the matt damon of your show oh, yeah, yeah. Just... i got i got people queuing up to be my matt damon they all want to feud with me ah they all want to feud, I'll feud with you, you. Um, gary I'll, has I'll, an right. arch enemy already i do i'll ruin my, jeff, I'll ruin my jeff, entrance jeff, okay. jeff Keeley is my arch enemy i can't stand that guy wait where's he gone Where, no, where's he gone what's he doing <laughs> have you had anybody just run out on the interview yet because uh... um 
<laughs> I mean, maybe now we have. The, the, the nice thing is I've got you on a hot mic no matter where you go. You can run yeah, away, but I, I can was, still I, hear you. I was laying in your bed earlier, by the way. What? I took I a saw picture of you. I actually, I actually don't mind that. I only, I only have two requests when guest comes to my island. Guest comes to my island. I don't touch I my. I can't get in the. You can do. It. You just keep, keep, keep pushing. Sofa. No, I'm, I'm walking. Push you. Push. Jordan's in the way. You're almost there. There you oh, go. That, that really did help. You got but it. I, you got it. You got it. I like you to, got it. I like to talk to HR because I got groped a little bit there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We're not that kind Yeah, he just nodded. You see it's that? A fam like... Family show, Hugh, may I remind you. It's going out in the morning. Kids are watching. Thank That's you, okay. Sir. I enjoyed it. All right. So, Hugh, I touched on this earlier, but I wanted to bring it up now you're here because, A, because you're a, a smart person that can give me a smart take on this, but also because, like, you're here. And I can say this is kind of what's amazing about this virtual talk show. Like, I'm sitting here behind my desk. I've got two guests on the couch, and Adam's over there behind the drums. But in reality, I'm in San Francisco, California. Hugh, you're in New York City. Jordan's in Montpellier, France. And, and Adam's all the way over there in Canada. And yet we're all kind of sitting on this couch. And like, I know we're kind of used to this now, but like, I still... I'm having a little moment right now where it occurs to me that that's kind of amazing. And it's really the only way you could do a show like this during quarantine conditions. So I wanted to ask you, Hugh, before we talk about your books and your work and stuff like that, as a, you know, you're not just a science fiction author, like you're a futurist. You spend a lot of time thinking and talking about what the future is going to look like. And right now there's a lot of conversations going on about the metaverse and how games are evolving um, into... But like basically beyond games into becoming these these virtual spaces like you know they're putting on these epic rock concerts in Fortnite. um you know people are getting married in animal crossing and now we have this live talk show in animal crossing you can stop preening by the way thank you that's good um so i just i just wanted to ask you here as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about the future like it's literally your job um what do you think about what do you think about this as, as it applies to like the metaverse and everything that's going on as we migrate into virtual spaces? Is this is this indeed the future of talk shows? Please say yes. Uh, I think it. I think this is the future of a lot of things, and it'll never be a hundred percent the future. But if you look at trend lines, it's just um, this is going to be more and more how we interact and how we interface. I mean, it and take the long view. Don't just go back to you know our lifetimes, but look over the last uh, thousand years or so and how much things are becoming more and more remote as communication tools come online. So, you know, the telegraph started um, people doing business at a distance when they couldn't before and radio, telephone, uh, TVs, VR, like every one of these tools has uh, brought people uh, together socially without bringing them together physically. So yeah, um, I, I, Peter F. Hamilton had a great uh, short story in one of his collections where there was a, a was a murder mystery on a planet where people are so germaphobic they do not go see each other in person so no one can figure out how someone could have been murdered because no one like goes into someone else's houses no one can overcome that stigma right. and um, the world the world he presented was so believable um, just how once VR gets so good that you can like tell a presence anywhere why would you leave your house Right. And uh, I've thought about that story a lot and, you know, even more lately. But yeah, I I mean, I, why put on pants if you don't have to? And I think I mean, more and more I, people I, are going to. I, I say it many times. Half the reason I have my job is it doesn't require I wear real pants. That's I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. like the biggest appeal for me. Yeah, um, if you could see all of us right now, this is not a children's show uh, behind the I'm scenes. Like, yeah, the light, yeah if, they, if my camera went on right now, my God, we would. I think we'd get yeah. banned from Twitch immediately. We're not doing that. I don't even have <laughs> a sure. camera set up in this scene because I don't want to accidentally turn it on. Um, do you think Do you think that the quarantine has kind of accelerated this a little bit? Like it's forced us to, to, to come up with these solutions. Like I don't think this. I would have come up with the idea for this talk show if it were not for the quarantine giving me the time to do it and the inclination to think, hey, maybe people would like to watch this because no one's got anything better to do right now. So everyone's figuring out ways to kind of work virtually, to socialize work virtually, like just simple things. Like my kid plays Battleship with the neighbor, the neighbor kid down the street over FaceTime. And those are little things, but they all add up. So I guess the question is, do you think this quarantine is kind of accelerating our migration into these virtual spaces? Because that's the only, those are, those are the only spaces we have right now. Not only that, I think it's, um, I think it's going to make germaphobes out of people who were never really germaphobes before. And so, um, you know, living in New York, I don't know what this is going to mean for like subway ridership. Um, it, it could have a terrible effect where people use uber more because they don't they feel like subways are where you you know get get regular flu in addition to all these other um you know terrible uh viruses like we're going through now 
And、uh, if if that ridership goes down, but the same number of people are trying to work and commute here, the traffic's going to get worse. I mean,、uh, I, I think we're going to have effects from this for the rest of the lifetime of the people who went through it.、Um, the, just like the flying never felt the same after nine eleven, and、right. airports never operated the same. Like we we take our shoes off now, and、right. these you know life just will never go back to normal once you have these big scarring events. Um, like we've had a couple of times in our lifetimes. So that was actually going to be my next question. Now we've all had all had these conversations over the last month or so, but I'm particularly interested to talk to you because again, as someone who really thinks a lot about the future and imagines different futures,、um, and a lot of sci-fi authors have said that the the events of the last couple of months have already thrown out a lot of preconceptions about how we'd react to these events and what the future might look like afterwards. And we've talked about how after we go back to normal, it's not going to be the old normal. It's going to be some kind of new normal where things, some things will never be the same again. Have you thought about that much? Like, what do you, what do you think the new normal is going to look like when this is over, and what what kind of changes would you like to see?、Um, man, there's so there's so many ways to think about that. I I hope that people.、Uh, one of the things that I really hope is that people are using this time to appreciate things that we took for granted, just the ability to go see family and friends and. There's always the sense, like, well, you know, I can do that later. I can put these things off, and、um, I, I hope we don't ever take that for granted again. And I hope、uh, our, our, I hope our appreciation of the social contact that we have to, had to put up with not having now、um, becomes something we cherish more in the future.、Um, I, I think people are gonna not eat at restaurants as much, and the good side of that is that maybe they'll cook at home more and spend time with small, intimate gatherings where you can actually hear what people are saying. You know, I I love eating out, but a lot of restaurants are so loud you can't have a, a good conversation with the people you're with.、Um, I hope a lot of people who are like stuck serial dating and never really figuring out that being with one person for a long period of time is like one of the great treasures in life.、Um, if you got caught、uh, alone in this. It must be. I think about these people all the time. All my f- single friends who are just like home alone and don't have someone to be with.、Um, how many of those people are going to come out of this and be like, you know, I'm going to make it work with someone and stop this like hedonistic treadmill of of being on dating apps and constantly being with someone new, but like make it work. So I, I try to think of all the positive things that can come out of this instead of just the negatives. Yeah, my 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 first answer is kind of the same as yours. I always talk about gratitude and how I hope we'll have greater gratitude for the things that we, as you said, took for granted before、um, this happened. Because you know, a lot of those things aren't for granted anymore. And I, 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 I don't know. I kind of feel like humans are really bad at learning lessons from the past. And maybe like this, we'll all go back to normal, like none of this ever happened, and we'll forget everything that we that we that we're supposed to learn from it. It's possible.、Um, I mean, it, if we want to learn stuff from 9/11, it's also it's the kind of thing that people with bad intents will use to manipulate us and use a little bit of、uh, fear mongering to retain power or、um, make us fearful of other people. You know, a lot of xenophobia came out of 9/11, and you already see、uh, trends of that where people are, are blaming regions as if this, you know, this this could have come from anywhere. So.、Uh, That worries me a little bit. That、uh, the global community that was developing will will get more of this nationalism and borders and travel restrictions, and that would be you know someone who's spent the last few years like really just going all over the world and seeing how similar we are and how you know beautiful、uh, different cultures are. To be really sad if we all、uh, pull into our silos to、um, plug a, a book series I wrote. Yeah, speaking of silos. You've、uh, again. You're like you're, man. You're taking some tips from Jordan. You know, like, you know, you know. Steer the conversation towards the things you want to plug. I'm very impressed. I was paying attention, man. Very impressed.、Um, I, I don't forget. So not right now, but in a moment, I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna have some questions for、uh, Hugh from the chat. If you have a question for、uh, New York Times best-selling author Hugh Howey. Um, uh, get them ready because we're gonna. I'm gonna、uh, ask them in a moment. Don't ask them now because they'll scroll off the screen. And I won't see them. But like when I say, give me some questions. Have them ready to go. Like type it in and get ready to hit return or whatever, and we'll, and we'll go. But Hugh, I do want to talk to you about your work. Just like Jordan, you've got books、uh, that you're that you're happy to come talk about,、uh, and I, I'm happy to talk to you about them. So I, here's what is fascinating about you, Hugh. You're a New York Times best-selling author. You've sold I don't even know how many books, but a lot, a lot, hundreds, a, hundreds, 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 count literally dozens and hundreds of books. <laughs> Um, all over the world, and you know, published all over the world in multiple languages, and you know, TV deals and movie deals and all kinds of things are happening, and it's very exciting. But what I love about what you did is you didn't just write a tremendous debut novel; you did it in a very, very unconventional way. You didn't go like shopping a manuscript around 
uh, to publishers. You you just went ahead and self-published the first chapter of it on your website, um, and and it kind of grew. From, you, I mean, you tell the story. Tell, tell me tell me about the genesis of Wool and and the unconventional way in which you kind of brought it brought it in front of an audience. Yeah, it'd be a lot like um, just starting up a, a a TV talk show in your basement inside of a video game. Who who of, would be stupid to do some, stupid enough to do something like that? <laughs> That's yeah, never gonna I, work. You, you, you know what helped me, and I think this helps you as well, is that I never thought I'd be successful. So I could, it freed me up to do things that uns, that normally successful people were not doing at the time. So I was working in a bookstore, and honestly, when I was I was so excited to be writing and completing stuff because I'd spent 20 years like giving up on novels and I was writing that I, I was just looking for a way to get them out there so like you know an aunt could read them and uh and that freed me up from worrying about my career and just worrying about the writing and trying to please one reader and I, I was super fortunate that at the time that I started writing all these tools came along not just ebooks and and digital readers but print on demand which allowed you to um not have to like have a, a garage full of books that no one wanted to read. You could just upload a PDF. And if someone right. ordered a book, they printed and ship it in the same day. So if I if I tried to become a, a writer five years earlier, those tools wouldn't have been there. If, I'd, if I would have done it five years later, too many talented people would have been using those tools for me to make you know a, a splash. So um, I got very lucky in A, that I didn't take myself seriously, and B, that like all these um, tools of production were coming available to different kind of creative people, but authors in particular. Did and you, uh yeah so go ahead did you, did you ever consider the conventional route of just shopping a manuscript to a publisher or did that never interest you like your first instinct was always like i'm just going to find a way to, to bring this to an audience directly it morphed so my first instinct was i'm just going to publish this story on, on a blog a chapter at a time and my friends can read it and then i sent the manuscript to some to some friends and uh, a random person on a forum that i was a member of asked for a copy and turned out uh, she's a huge science fiction fan and an, and an editor and she loved it she's like look this is better than the last 10 things i've bought from a bookstore don't sell yourself short uh she knew how i was talking about publishing and she said you should send this around and so i didn't i honestly did not want to do that but she kind of um talked me into it and got me excited about maybe maybe this is better than i thought and so i researched querying agents and all this stuff it seemed like a nightmare but i went through it anyway and um within like two weeks i had two different small presses ask for a full manuscript off a sample and they both made an offer and i went with one of them and i uh, i don't know it just felt like i was silly not to take something that everyone else was trying so hard to get even though my heart was like you should just do this yourself so you and, just, sorry, sorry finish your thought i'm sorry I didn't mean to yeah my that. first so my first book was actually published with a small press um and i, I learned a lot from it I learned a lot of writing skills from that editorial process but also watched how they published it. They were using the same tools that were available to me. They were using print on demand and they were very ebook forward, which a lot of small publishers were and are. Right. And uh, and I realized, man, these are like one-time services that I'm paying for. And they're gonna make, I'm gonna do all the hustling and try to get all my friends and family to buy copies. And they're gonna keep more per book than I'm gonna make. And that didn't just didn't seem sensible to me. I'm like, I would rather have the freedom to control the cover art. I wanted to like even do the pagination, like lay out the interiors of the books. Right. So I I got an offer from them for the sequel, and instead I said, "Can I buy the rights back to the first book?" And they were taken aback, but we had developed a good relationship, and so they were gave me their blessing. But I still had the email from the editor who was like, "This is the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your career." Huh. And um, yeah, and I, I have no hard feelings for them. Like I even feel bad that they got left out of the success that my later books became. But I don't think I would have had that success if I'd have been on their production schedule. It's always satisfying and, uh, when you prove your doubt is wrong. Yeah, and you know you know, the biggest one has been myself. Like I've doubted myself the whole way and every time I, and I've had more people believe in me like my mom and my sister and people who really believed in my writing early. And I think they get a thrill out of watching me be the doubter that they prove wrong. Like as right. good things have happened to me, they've been like, see, told you, knew you could do it. So that's that's been fun to have cheerleaders in my life that like, would push me when I was down. My mom still um, asked me all the time, like, when do I have something new to read? She's constantly, um, you know, asking for pages, which is is a good thing to have in your life. So I want to I want to talk to you specifically about Wool, which is the book that kind of made your name initially. So you you pub you published it kind of in the most kind of humble, low key way possible, just like you know, it's like a, they said, kind of a chapter book in episodes. 
um, on your own personal blog. At what at what point? And you you, you explained to me like how it was how it, how it started to, to to become popular. But like at what point did you first start to think, oh wow, like this might this might actually be blowing up? Um, it, it came, that came in stages. The first time it's I think I sold like a thousand copies in one month, which I never thought I'd sell of anything. And it was, this is when it was just one ninety nine cent uh, kind of novelette, like a twelve thousand word story. I love all the applause I'm getting from your, um, from your band. It makes me so oh, happy. I love it. I um, love it. So, uh, and then the next month it sold 3,000. The next month it sold 10,000. So I just saw it on this like upward slope and I was making more from a 99 cent, you know, uh, ebook that I was making at my bookstore job. And I, I started getting calls from agents who wanted to represent me. And then I started getting film options. The first one was like from the BBC. And then the next one was from Ridley Scott. So that was like, you know, on an upward trajectory as well. And I think maybe the conversation with, with Ridley and, and his team and uh, was when I started thinking like, this is surreal. And that was about when I put my two week notice in and started realizing I'm gonna have to have some free time to devote to all the, the nonsense that was happening. But yeah, and, and in some ways it's never, it's never really sunk in. Like I still don't feel like a, a writer. I feel like I'm all these other things and writing is something I do on the side. Right. While you were talking there, Hugh, I, tu- I forgot to turn our alerts on. I just turned the alerts on. And now if you follow or subscribe or do bits or cheers, or whatever, we have these wonderful new uh, Animal Crossing themed uh, alerts that we plugged into the into the into the channel. Uh, and it's really quite adorable. And I like those. We use those on Animal Crossing mornings as well. But OK, so Hugh, I want to talk to you for like re- for real, for real, real um, about All right. I'm going to I'm going to go over here uh, to my other page. And this is uh, like your personal Web page. Uh, for wool and the reason why i want to like why it's it's so perfect you're on the show right now this is this is a book and people can go find out uh more about it i'm gonna i'm gonna post an amazon link in the chat in just a moment um but what's amazing about this book um is that it's a story about a future in which everyone is cooped up inside and no, you know, everyone's on lockdown and no one can go outside because it's not safe. I mean, I know you wrote this several years ago, but do you, I mean, do you, do you feel like you kind of were accidentally kind of prophetic? I mean, it's a very different, you know, what happens in wool is like much more apocalyptic, but the, but the parallels are, are kind of weird. Do you, do you feel like the book is now, is kind of weirdly timely now? Yeah, the parallels really are strange. And, and even more than that, the book is uh, almost 10 years old now. And it's crazy. We're doing a big like relaunch with a, um, a major publisher uh, this year for the for the first time. Um, so the whole series is coming out with uh, uh, a New York publisher and going to hit bookstores and have new cover art and box sets and all this stuff. And it's it's nuts that a book I wrote like almost ten years ago is, is getting that kind of treatment. But it's become I think even more when I wrote it. Some of the things were satirical, and now when you read them, they feel like I'm commenting on uh, the uh, current times. Like you know, this I wrote this before Snowden. Uh, right. And we found out like all the snooping and the, the servers full of information about everything that we say and do. And in the book, that's a huge part of the plot is that there's these servers that keep up with everything you say. And, and now it seems like, of course, you would include that. And it seems quaint and topical. And at the time, people are, are like, uh, you know, thought it was pretty outlandish. I don't know. It's um, it's like how 1984 and Brave New World were really over the top. And then things happen. You watch you know, uh, history being rewritten to suit people's narratives. And you're like, oh, that's right out of George Orwell. So um, I, I think the best science fiction comments on the, the weird things about our times and tries to warn about possible futures, I just don't think it should happen this quickly. So I do get some some hate mail from people who think that I'm responsible for all this by, by writing about it. First of all, I want to apologize to Jordan Mechner, who's Chiron. Uh, I for- Adam just learned what a Chiron is the other day through doing this show. I forgot to put his Chiron up on the screen, so I'm going to do it real quick. Sorry, Jordan, I should have done that earlier when you were on the couch. I totally... Oh, wait, we need, oh, we need to update our cheer emote, Adam, because look, that's not playing as Animal Crossing yet. That's like an old... That's like an old emote. I'm going to turn those off until we get them fixed. But we're going to work on the emotes. Um, the Animal Crossing... I don't know why there isn't... Why the cheer emote's not coming through. Maybe I didn't turn it on. Anyway, anyway, I want to ask you this, you. I just came up with what I think is an interesting question. Um, if you were to write Wool today, would it be any different based on what you've kind of absorbed and learned from the situation we're currently going through? You know, when I think about rewriting something, especially Wool, I think I just think about how terrible it would be because I would be thinking about the fact that millions of people are going to read this thing and that it's going to be like read by people in other languages. So I would be worried about idioms and 
um, you know, making the job hard on translators. There's so many things that would get in my way if I was writing it now. When I was writing it at the time, I thought I was writing it for myself. You know, I was writing it、um, with an audience of none, and that that's the most freeing way to write.、And、I have to constantly remind myself when I'm writing these days to just write what you want. No one's going to read this,、um, and yeah, that'd be the challenging thing. And the pressure, like, will change my life. It allowed me、um, to、uh, write full time and to、um, you know、uh, see the world and and have a lot of freedoms. So the pressure of messing that up, you know, at the time, I, I didn't I didn't there was no pressure on me at all when I wrote it. I think that's、uh, absolutely right. And as a as a baby author myself, I.、Um... I think I, I I agree with you wholeheartedly. In fact, when I sell, I'm not going to plug it or link it. I'll do that another time. But when I decided to go about publishing my first novel, I hit you up and I asked you for your advice. So I'm going to ask you now: if there's someone out there with a burning idea for a story, a short story, or a novel,、um, from everything you've learned and obviously you've been tremendously successful as an author and a novelist、uh, and a writer in all kinds of different media,、um, what advice would you give to someone out there who's sitting on a novel, a manuscript, and they want to find a way to get it published, get it in front of an audience? What What, what have you learned that you could pass on to people like that who are just starting out? If they've if they've already finished a manuscript and they've got it、um, written, that I think the first thing they need to do is get as many readers on it as possible.、Um, don't be scared of someone stealing your ideas, or、um, that just doesn't doesn't really happen. And when it does happen, it happens in the best way possible. We all do it.、Um, get you know find an online critique group, which there's a lot right now, and read other people's writing and have them read yours and get notes and see how to strengthen it. Once you're Totally satisfied with your manuscript.、Um, I still think the best thing to do is to self-publish it, and that's how you and I publish our anthology. That's how I I think of everything I write now. First thing I'm going to do it that self-publish it, and then if a publisher comes in and and makes an offer or an agent swoops in or something, that's a bonus. But、right. the number the number one thing is make it available, get it out there, and then start working on the next project. I love、uh, there's there's no marketing in the world like writing another、um, another book. So just keep keep writing and get it out there, and、um, you're going to get better as you you you, you know you're not going to make it on your first novel. You just got to keep practicing and keep getting lottery tickets out in the world, and hope you hope you get lucky and lucky in readership more than anything else. I love the fact that Hugh, that while you were talking, we had someone just stumble into the chat, a user by the name of Terry Aki Yakitori, who, by the way, is very welcome. We're very excited to have him in the chat. We love all our followers. Um, who seems to have no idea what he stumbled into? Because we're not in the talk show <laughs> channel. We're not in the talk show channel. We're not in the just chatting channel. We're in the Animal Crossing channel with all the other Animal Crossing streams. And Terry Aki Yakitori appears to have clicked on this stream and has and he's got what is going on? How? Why are these people talking? And and it's it's fascinating to see to freak people out.、Um, just you know, Lee has already posted some helpful information in the chat. But for anyone、uh, like me and Adam who has no idea what is currently going on. Um, I'll try to explain it to you. This is the world's uh, foremost um, uh, Animal Crossing talk show. It is a live late night talk show、uh, that we do both late nights and in the mornings, and, it, and it's all done within the world of Animal Crossing. There's no modding. There's no hacking. We don't do any tricks. Everything that you see, all the items,、uh, it's all done within the、uh, the world of Animal Crossing. I'm going to swoop out here and give you a god's eye view.、Uh, here's our set. This is the basement. Uh, in my Animal Crossing house, and I'm going to give you a little swoop around here. You can see the whole studio. Got my little Nintendo Switch on the table there. Adam's got his very cool band area. All the instruments work,、um, and、uh, we have our couch and our desk. And there's actually lots and lots of little、um, Easter eggs here.、Um, you know, we 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 try to、uh, build this set in a way that it pays tribute. To、um, uh, my favorite talk shows. I mean, obviously the the Tonight Show is the is the gold standard. We tried to make this look like the Tonight Show as much as possible.、Uh, but the, you know, the the greenery in the background is very much a tribute to、uh, the Larry Sanders show.、Uh, you know, Larry always had a lot of a lot of plants and, and greenery behind him. Just right over here, give you a quick tour. This golf bag here is kind of a tribute. Uh, to Johnny Carson, you know Johnny. Johnny Carson loved to play golf. Yeah, come over and take a look here.、Um, I was going to try to get in your seat while you're out of it. No, no, no. Nobody sits in the host seat without my permission. Thank you very much. Don't get, don't get any ideas. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> and Johnny always mimicked. So he always mimed a golf swing、uh, when he、um, when he put when he when he when he landed a joke. And that's the golf clubs back there are kind of a little tribute to Johnny, the greatest talk show host of all time. Keep trying, you. You'll get it. You'll get there. Get there you go. There you go. You got to come in kind of from the side.、Um, And、uh, and then of course we are literally between two ferns, 
And there's, mo- there's lots of little Easter eggs and things like that, little tributes to my favorite talk shows, both real and imagined. Uh, I look like fictional. a fictional. What's that? You kind of look, look like. A- I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that you're going to get lost with all the greenery in the background. You look like one of the plants on the set. Um, this is how I speak up on uh, bugs in Animal Crossing. Right, right, right. I hear you. Um, I also want to give you an opportunity, uh, uh, Hugh, to talk about something. Actually, two things I'm going to, because one of them is, is something that you and I created together. So we're definitely going to plug that. But I want to talk to you a little bit about this new thing uh, you've got coming out. It's available for pre-order right now. Uh, I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's called the Dystopia Triptych. Tell, tell me a little bit about this. This is um, three anthologies um, about uh, different dystopian worlds and about a dozen to 15 authors came up with. Um, John Joseph Adams and I uh, edited these and we did one uh, seven years ago or so that was a post-apocalyptic um, trilogy of short stories. And this one's a dystopian one. And, you know, we pl- we started working on this two years ago. We didn't know things would get quite this dystopian um, while we were working on it. But uh, just some of the top writers in science fiction coming up with amazing stories. And what's great is each, uh, each story has like a, a three part beginning, middle and end that goes across the three anthologies. So um, it's a really cool structure. We had a really huge success with the, the first trilogy of these that we did. And um, man, so I wish I could tell you about all the stories that are that are in this set. I mean, some of the um, best writing that I've come across and just as an editor, it's uh, it's wild to be editing people who, that you look up to as, as writers and right. have contribute. You know, I wrote three stories for the works as well and um, really happy with how it came out. But like, it's terrifying trying to contribute when the other stuff that's coming in is so good. But it's a good problem to have. We got an embarrassment of riches in this series, and the cover art's incredible, and should be up uh, in June next month. These will all be available online. So you can pre-order that right now. We actually did. Leo and I both dropped links into the chat. So if you're interested, I'm going to do it one more time just for good measure. If you're interested in um, in uh, checking out the uh, dystopia uh, triptych that Hugh has helped uh, put together. Um, you can see those links in the chat right now. But then the other thing I want to talk about, Hugh, not only do we know each other and we're friends, we actually collaborated um, last year on a project together. And I'm going to take the opportunity, because it's kind of cool, I get to plug your book, but also plug mine um, at the same time. So just to tee this up a little, Hugh and I talked about this. Um, I'm not I, you know, I'm not going to do politics on the show. We're not going to get into that. It's a family show. It's wholesome. I don't want to do anything divisive or unpleasant on the show. But Hugh and I, um, after the most recent election, were a little bit disgruntled and you know we felt like we wanted to talk about that a little bit like how we were feeling about the way that the world is in through our writing and i know i know for a fact that a lot of other science fiction writers out there uh were feeling the same way that they wanted to kind of speak to what they felt like was going on in the current kind of social and political moment through their writing that's what good science fiction writers do that's what we're supposed to do and so hugh and i came up with an idea for a a short story a fiction anthology um and I'm gonna I'm gonna link to it right now. It's called um, it's called Resist: Tales from a Future Worth Fighting Against. And Hugh uh, and myself and Christy Yant were the three editors uh, of this book. And it put and it brings together some of the top top names in science fiction writing um, who uh, contributed original stories for this. And they did it all for free. Uh, they, they didn't, we didn't pay them anything, and that's not. And that's not because I'm super mean. That's not because I'm super tight with my. I mean, I am, but that wasn't the reason why I didn't pay anyone. And I'm, put, I'm dropping the Amazon link into the chat right now. If anyone's interested, you can get a paperback, you can get a, a, a Kindle book or whatever. Go check it out. It's really genuinely an amazing read. And half of all the profits, um, or I, I can't remember what it is. It's a certain percentage, but like a chunk of the profits. Um, when you buy the book, actually, uh, we make a contribution to the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, and it's their, you know, their their sole purpose in in their existence is to uphold the Bill of Rights, and that's obviously a very important mission that they do over there at the ACLU. Uh, so, without getting too political, uh, I mean, it is a political book. You know, I think all really good science fiction is, is political in some way, and Resist is very political. And Hugh and I um, are very proud of it, right? Hugh, I, I thought it turned out great. I'm super proud of it. And actually, uh, all we've got it set up where all the profits are going to the ACLU. And we, um, I incurred some production costs, but that's just my, my contribution as well as a story to the thing. Like it's one of those passion projects where you, you, you doesn't, it's not about making money. It's about, um, uh, you know, just getting a message out there. And, um, I think for all the authors, everything we heard back from them was just such a, an, 
a bit of release. Like it was a lot of therapy. Oh yeah, they loved. They were like, "Thank you for giving me the opportunity to kind of speak to this because it's been driving me crazy." That they were a lot of them are very happy to do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and and again, thank you, Hugh, for helping. I, I I had an idea to kind of call up science fiction authors and like cobble together some stories, and maybe I would have like thrown it onto like a blog page or something. But you, had, because you have so much experience with self publishing and you know ISBN numbers and all that stuff, that you know I that bores me. But you you know how to do it, um, and so we actually got to publish like a proper book. And uh, I couldn't have done that without you, Hugh. So thank you very much. Yeah, and we couldn't have done it without Christy either. And she's Christy's um, great. She's, she's uh, editing that new uh, series that you put a link up to as well. So uh, it started with John Joseph and I, and um, we got halfway into it, and we're like, we need Christy. And so she's kind of the one who actually makes things happen. So um, I am really thrilled that she came in on our project as well. She's yeah. amazing. The other thing I want to talk to you before, um, I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about this next topic. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about Animal Crossing. And then I'm going to take questions from the chat. But I want to, I, I want to talk to you, Hugh, because you have such a fascinating life. Um, I want to talk to you about your, uh, your life on the ocean waves. Because what many people may not know about you, they know you're a best-selling author, but they may not know also that you are like a proper skipper. Like you professionally are trained and know how to captain like a big boat. Well, not just like a canoe or whatever, like a, like a proper big boat, right? That's actually something, before you were an author, that's actually what you do, did for a living. Is that correct? Yeah. I My first uh, real career was as a yacht captain. Um, I moved onto a boat when I was in college. So I was, I've been a sailor a lot, lot longer than I've been a writer. I was like, 19 or 20 when I bought my first sailboat for like $10,000 just kind of used um, really a bucket like it's crazy that I've lived on this thing for about five or six years right and uh, yeah I dropped out of college and sailed off to the Bahamas and spent a year just like island hopping and and that led me to work on odd jobs on other people's boats which uh, got my captain's license and by the time I was 23 I was um, living on these like 20 million dollar yachts and um, you know don't let it sound too romantic because you're basically like the, a glorified bus driver um, and mechanic, you know, just constantly fixing these things for these rich people who own them. But uh, it was insane. Spent like 10 years working in that industry and just driving boats all over the place. And so when I um, uh, got out of yachting to um, work odd jobs and try to make it as a writer, the dream was always to get back on a boat and take off and, and sail across oceans and finally did that. Spent right. the last uh, about, I don't know, five years ago, I um, built a boat in South Africa and, and sailed across the Atlantic and went up to Maine and New York and then down through the canal and spent about three years in the South Pacific. So and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a link. I'm going to put up a page from an interview you did with uh, Sailing Today magazine. Um, and this is a little look, look into the, the real life of Hugh Howie. He's not just a cartoon character sitting on my couch. There's a picture here, Hugh, of you sitting in the Caribbean with like our man in Havana kind of hat on. Just looking like like Ernest Hemingway or something. Like this is your life for a for a long time, right? Uh, yeah. I didn't always have a that a, a hat or a shirt on, but that was like, yeah, that's a funny picture. There's, there's pictures here that's of you on like the boat. There, that next so, one, I mean, like no, no, fixing this, this, something on the boat. This catamaran here, the Wayfinder. So basically, what happened was you took the proceeds or some of the proceeds from your best-selling books, and you cust you had this boat build built to your custom design, right? Yeah, I was in the yard every day helping build it, wiring up lights and getting to know all the people in the yard. I lived in South Africa for half a year while the boat was being built. And, wow. and, like, and, 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 and why custom made? Like, did you have very specific specifications for what you wanted the Wayfinder to be? I just, I, fa I found a builder that I loved. And, and when I um, talked to them about the boat, they said, yeah, we're, they only build one boat at a time. It's a very family run business. And they're in, you know, in a very remote part of South Africa. And uh, the guy who started the company, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but he uh, he built a boat for him and his family to sail around the world. And he got so hooked on building the boats and people kept buying them that he just stayed there. And for about, I don't know, 40 years, he just would build boats one at a time. And he builds them to everyone's specifications. So you go uh, to the yard and they, they lay out the whole boat with kind of cardboard and you walk around it and you're like, yeah, let's move this a little bit. Let's move that there. And then you come back and they've, fiberglass it all in. And when I found out about that, like I working on boats for so long and living on my own boat for, for years, I had um, learned a lot about what I would love to see. And so they were actually learning from my modifications and started making all their future boats with the same. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so I kind of became a consultant because now they even changed their mold. Now the new boats that pop out all look like my boat. 
That's amazing. And uh, yeah, they they called it the Mark II. Like they basically had to to signify that it was a new version. And um, yeah, anyway, it was. I had so much fun building the boat that I thought, man, should I actually go sailing or should I do what this guy did and just like buy the yard and start building boats for the rest of my life? I was honestly tempted by it. It was such a such a fun process. Jordan, you've been very quiet over there, but I want to bring you into the conversation. Are you are you laying down? What are you picking up? What um what uh, Hugh's putting down here? Do you, I mean, I, I know you've got a very nice yeah. life out there in France, but we, the idea of sailing around the uh, the Caribbean on a, on a custom-made uh, catamaran must seem quite appealing to you also. Yeah, I'm actually not so good with boats, but the traveling around the world part sounds awesome. Are you done now for, for, for now, Hugh? I know you're back in uh, New York City. For are you, are you are you a landlubber again, or are you going to be back out on the ocean? I'm going to be back on the ocean, but I think I, I'm probably looking at two years of being... Um, uh, on land, I've got three things in development in uh, LA that um, have probably a better chance of me being around. And it's one of those things you don't, as you know, because I don't know if, if everyone knows who's watching the show, but like you are a major Hollywood uh, screenwriter and the book of Eli, which is unbelievable that everyone should go watch while they're in quarantine. And since it's May the 4th, everyone oh, should on. go. Can I not? The audience not isn't come? liking it. There's no book of Eli fans in the. Uh, Rogue <laughs> One. I think oh, Rogue One. everyone likes Rogue One. Oh, everyone yeah. likes Rogue One. There you go. That's ten years. So, uh, um, yeah, you know what it's like. Like you don't get to choose when things get made in Hollywood. You kind of have to. Uh, it's a lot of luck involved. But right now, like while we're in lockdown, like one of my things got greenlit. Another one has an unbelievable team behind it, and the the pilot just got sent off. And the notes are that this looks like it could actually get made. And then three days ago, I got a, another project that's um, underway that uh, I'm really excited about that you worked on at one point. In oh, yeah. So at one, at one point, I actually wrote a TV adaptation of Hugh's uh, book, Sand, which is another kind of post-apocalyptic uh, world. And it's a really amazing book. You should say, if you like wool, you'll definitely like Sand. And I actually wrote a TV pilot and we developed it for a while. And again, like 99% of almost everything that's developed in Hollywood, uh, it never came to fruition. But that's that's something that's still, that you're still working on in some form, right? Yeah, just got, uh, just got a huge leap forward. And man, I'm so bummed that, because I, I want your script to be the thing that gets shot. I don't. I know that that doesn't work in Hollywood. I know like, that's go, always really yeah. Because like you know whoever whoever made that script like they paid for it and like they'll just sit on it like they'll you'll never get that script out to, like for someone else yeah. to make. It's really annoying. That that kind of stuff happens all the time. But so here's the thing, you as a as a I want to talk to you about Animal Crossing. And now is a great time, by the way, to drop start dropping any questions you have for you into uh, for you into the chat because I'm going to talk to him briefly about Animal Crossing. And then I do want to uh, drop him some some questions uh, from the chat. Um, so, uh, you know, as a sailor who's floated around the Caribbean on all these different tropical islands in real life, um, island life here and in and in Animal Crossing New Horizons must must suit you very well. Yeah, it feels like home. It's been and I know everyone loves Animal Crossing because they're cooped up and it's so relaxing just to walk around and and see beaches and ocean. But for me, it's super soothing. It's it's a uh, therapy. Like I, I spend most of my time just walking around looking for uh, fossils. But um, and I, and we we get out of the uh, apartment here. It's like uh, really um, healthy and safe to go walking around New York because there's lots of space. There's no traffic. You can people are like kind of in the street. Everyone's social distancing. Everyone's wearing masks. But the weather's been great and there's lots of green spaces to go to get out of. But every morning I wake up and think, ah, I'm just going to go take a little stroll in Animal Crossing. And it's been a nice bit of therapy. Really enjoyed I, it. You know, it, it's been exactly the same for me. My Animal Crossing mornings stream that I do, I start the day. Every day since the game came out, I've streamed the game every morning. Animal Crossing mornings with Gary. It's It's gone viral. It's a big hit. Everyone's talking about it. You can't get away from the talk about Animal Crossing mornings with Gary. And I got to say, I, I love doing it. It's great therapy for me. It's become a great way for me to start my day. Puts me in a positive mood. Um, and, 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 and you know, you know, they say that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, I kind of feel like Animal Crossing is like the most important video game of the day. Starting my day uh, with it in the morning. It's just it just gets me it just gets me off on the right foot. Now, uh, I, I I talked to you before the show, uh, Hugh, and my wife Leah, who's the executive producer on the show, had her own tweet that went a little bit viral recently, uh, <laughs> talk, talking about how she uh, likes to when she 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 when she gets a a, a, a villager off her island, sometimes using uh, passive aggressive means. Uh, she uh, and there's been a lot of controversy about this. Some people think it's sick and twisted. Some, some people think it's a cool idea. Once the islander leaves her island, she erects a tombstone 
to them, and she's got this ever-growing graveyard of like ex-villagers, ex-islanders uh, on her island. Yeah, I, 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 I agree, Adam. It re I mean, it really is quite, quite shocking. Um, <laughs> but you, you mentioned it to me before the, the show, Hugh, that you, 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 you actually seemed to think it was, it was quite cool, right? You liked what Leah was doing with this graveyard. Yeah, I love it. Um, <laughs> I just, I, th I think what's so cool about these sandbox games is that no one. Uh, there's, it's not like a, a, a path you follow like a lot of single player games and you, you do the thing or you don't do the thing. And here there's, um, it's like Minecraft in a way where it's just exciting to see what people could do and murdering off uh, everyone on your island and uh, erecting tombstones. I, I don't think the game developers had that in mind and they didn't have a talk show in a basement in mind. And um, I love seeing the creativity of the user. It's really, really fun. Right, right, right. I, I mean, I, I think it definitely belongs in the same space as games like Fortnite and Minecraft. Well, maybe not so much Fortnite, but Minecraft and The Sims, where you can really kind of treat it just like a virtual dollhouse and create anything you want. I mean, look at what we've done here. It's ridiculous. Um, how, I mean, how, you said you like to go around collecting fossils. Like, how do you like to play the game? Do you want to have a beautiful island? Do you want to have a beautiful house? Do you want to have the best villages? Like, what, 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 like what, what's your approach to playing Animal Crossing? Yeah, I want to have all those things, but I, I never will because I just don't have the, uh, the patience to manicure everything my house I, I got a warning in the my mailbox from the home police uh the home academy the happy home academy yeah they're like you have you have trash laying around your house you need to pick it up and i looked at my house and i i thought it was nice stuff i don't know what they're talking about <laughs> my house is not is not pleasantly arranged I, i've been like and running around your house going like, oh my God, how I, I put a lot of work into my house, getting the ironwood furniture and the community has been very helpful. They send me things. They're very nice. And I'm very, very, very grateful uh, to all of them. Um, yeah, like I noticed like when I sell, when I buy my turnips on a Sunday, I need to sell them fast because the longer they're sitting around out there on Turnip Beach, the more I get dinged by the Happy Home Academy for like stuff littering my island. So I, I got to sell them quick. Yeah, speaking of which, if there's any viewers, I I, I bought turnips for the first time, and I'm I'm already regretting it. It's just I, I don't <laughs> I don't like and I don't like the risky investments and all that stuff. So I'm gonna have to find somebody that has like you know a two hundred dollar turnip price somewhere so I can unload all these things. So hopefully uh, I'll start casting about on Twitter or somewhere for Gary scoffs at two hundred dollar turnips. That's, that's that's chicken feed. Oh my god! I just, I just, I just want to, I just want to get out. Five, five, five hundred bells minimum, or I'm not getting out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Kill it needs for to 500 be. Bells. Listen, my stick, god. stick with me, Hugh. Stick with, friends, with me, because here's what I've got the, I've got the inside track on the elite internet, internet influencer dodo codes. That only, 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 uh, you know, super celebrities like me get a, get access to. So, oh my god! You know, All stick, right. stick with me, and I can, I can, I can get you on the fast track to multi billionaire status. I, I love it. I just want to pay off my damn house, man. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna trust, trust me. By the time I'm done with you, Hughes, Tom Nook's gonna be working for you. <laughs> I'm gonna turn. The, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get you to elite, elite premier status on Animal Crossing. Uh, um, before we, we I go, so there's one other thing. There's one other thing um, that I want to ask you. I know that your girlfriend Jill is there with you. You told me before the show <laughs> that she can do a remarkable imitation of an Animal Crossing character. So I'd like, to invite, I would like to invite you at this point to turn the mic over to her. I want to hear your girlfriend Jill's Animal Crossing voice, and we'll see what the chat thinks of it. Okay, here's here's Jill. <laughs> Wait a Holy second. Christ. That's Wait not the second. game. No, that's Wait just her. She that, can do it no, anytime. You, you, you played an MP3 there. Nah, it's freaky. The first time she... <laughs> do it, do it exactly. again. Do it, do, I, I need to hear yeah, it again. We need, do it we again. need more of that. More. Do it again. She'll come on the show. Because here's the thing. If she does it again, I'll literally have Adam CSI this. He'll match the two sound files, and I'll know that she's not just playing the MP3 back. I want to hear it again. Okay. Here she goes. That's, that, 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 that's incredible. How is that possible? You're, you're married to Isabel. I mean, sorry, you're giving Isabel for a girlfriend. Yeah, that's Every morning, I'm like, tell me this possible? about the TV show. I don't know. She, but she does this with like... She, you should hear her sing any song, any movie quote. She's like a. I might uh, have to. I might have to hire her to do some of that for my stream. Like I'm, I'm, maybe there's like some way that we can incorporate that into the stream. Yeah, she she does work for hire. You you've you you've done well for yourself there, Hugh. I can tell. I don't need. I don't even need to know anything else <laughs> about Jill. I can already tell that like in the relationship status, you've you've moved up. Yeah, all, all my friends are very jealous of me. And and and, and she, she she's 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 into board games. She's like oh the biggest God. geek. 
Oh my god. You, you, when you, you gotta put a ring on that finger, Hugh. What are you doing? Don't let that get away. Board games and Animal Crossing voices? Maybe we'll be the first couple to get engaged on an Animal Crossing talk show. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I have always wanted to do... I, I, Adam, did, 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 I swear to you. Did I, did I or did I not say this to you the other day? I have got a tuxedo. I've got a morning suit. I've got everything you need. I want to, at some point, officiate a wedding on this show. I will get licensed. He did, he did I will say go that. To, I will go we'll get one of those internet ministry things. I, w I want to marry someone on this. Now, I'm not saying I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. I feel like I could be creating serious issues in your relationship right now. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> it doesn't have to be you. It okay, doesn't have two to be things. you. Two, two things. I'm going to need to get at least 600 for my turnips so I can I I, treat, I, 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 know, I get you that I can get you that price tomorrow. The island, I, trust me, I give, know give a guy. The island, I know and, a guy. And the other thing is it would have to be in Leah's graveyard. <laughs> oh, I, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I think All we'll, right, we'll, we'll, talk. We'll, we'll, we'll do it. We'll uh, Hugh, we'll do a destination wedding. Also, we, yeah. have, a, we have a full time we'll stylist, uh, Kate, who will be able to take care of everybody. My, 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 the, the show I was stylist. Go like this. Kate, who is that? <laughs> Kate, who's the show stylist? She's going to dress you. You're going to look, you're going to look better than you ever. You're going to look amazing. You're going to look like a million dollars. Okay. Oh, is it, okay. Kate, do you want your, do you want your credit to say head of wardrobe? Because right now you're credited as stylist. If you would like me to change that, I will. Kate's always in the chat calls in trouble. All right, head of wardrobe. Adam, make make a make a note. We'll change that. Head of wardrobe. We'll work on it. <laughs> um, it's the thought that counts. I put her in the credits. So Hugh, no pressure. But if you do decide to make an honest woman of Jill, or or, or more 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 aptly, make an honest person of yourself. Um, I think I, th I think that would be I think that would be an oh and Leah mentioned that there, there is an object in the game which we possess. It's in our prop department. There is a Tiffany ring box in the game, and when you open it. There is a diamond in there, the size of, size of your fist, and I and I, I I'd be happy to to uh, provide that to you with with the compliments of the shot. You, I am she so sorry for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> this will Look, be our biggest no, rate. This is our biggest ratings ever through the if roof. There's no, if there's no vaccine, we might have to do it that way. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, this is this is the way to do it, Hugh. So you'd like let's, again, no pressure. Not trying to push you into anything, but like if you decide you're ready, ready to you know make a change in your life. <laughs> Let me know and we'll, and we'll and we'll do it. We'll do it in an incredible way. I would love Man, I was, that. Would be incredible. I was nervous to have to tell a joke on this show, and now oh, I'm you, like, and you still have about... to do that, by the way. Oh my! You still have to do that. <laughs> um, we did have a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, this one is. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm because I'm having to to pull up here. Um, oh, so. Uh, let me see. Uh, one last word asks the question, and I presume the answer is yes, but you never know. Will the dystopia triptych come out in paperback? It sounds like he's he's, he's excited, but only willing to pay paperback prices. So are you, <laughs> you going to be able to accommodate one last word? Yeah, I think it's already um, I think it's already on uh, pre-order for paperback. But yeah, there'll okay. there'll be a paperback and there'll be an audiobook edition. Um, McHoney or MC Honey, I never know which one it is. Uh, asks um, actually, actually, it's a comment, but it's a very nice one. I just want to say, Hugh, that I appreciate the way you write your female characters. Thank you for writing them as strong characters with realistic motivations. Now, both of your uh, first two big books, Hugh, uh, Wool and Sand, did have a uh, female protagonist. Was that, some, was that something that you were very uh, conscious of when you were writing, that you, that you wanted to do? And how, do you, how did you approach those characters um, uh, uh, because of that? Yeah, even, so my, my first book series as well, as a four-book four series, was also uh, a female protagonist. Um, I think two things. Um, as a reader, I when I when I sit down to write books, I want to write things that I feel like aren't out there right now. And as a reader, you get a little sick of like too much of the same. So I was trying to write um, something that I thought there was too few of. And, and you know, for books to be representative, there should be you know fifty one percent of the protagonist should be female. And and I don't think we're in that situation right now. Um, but I you know was raised by my mom and have an amazing sister and have. Um, you know, been lucky to be surrounded by really strong, powerful women. So I think that just influences when I think of like who kicks ass in this world. The first thing I think of is like the amazing women in my life. And I think that's just my personal bias of, of my past, but you know, we write what we know. And so I gotta get um, I gotta, my character's got to give that a little round of applause. Cause I, 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 I appreciate these sentiments. Oh, thanks. Making me bashful. <laughs> I love it. Um, we are coming up on, um, uh, the end of the show, uh, but, but but there's a couple of things we do uh, before we end. 
Um, before you arrived, before you uh, came to the show, you came to our island, uh, and I gave you both uh, gifts from the show. It's a very special gift that we lovingly wrapped, um, uh, and I would like you to... Um, oh, wait, <laughs> on, Kate, Kate has a question. I'm not sure if, if Hugh even knows what's going on here, but uh, tell me if, you, if, the, if, the, if the context of this question makes sense to you, Hugh. Did you order the egg sitter after seeing the clip? <laughs> I, I haven't yet, but I'm going to. That is amazing. I still don't believe it, and I want to order it just to um, test this thing. Like, I cannot believe you sat on an egg. I sat on an, an egg, and I didn't break it. Egg. That's incredible. Oh, it's, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. Um, but I have a firm, my, my butt's a lot firmer than yours, so I wonder. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing. Um, it, I think I think it works with butts of all firmless levels. Okay. We'll, so we'll give find it out. a try. <laughs> If any if anyone's butt is gonna break that egg, Hugh, it's yours. Because I mean, that, I mean, it's like a steel can, it's like a steel can back there, <laughs> unlike mine, which is which is which is more like a busted open can of beans that you'd find around the back of a you know a, a, a you know a, a dive restaurant. So should we open our gifts now? I would like you to open your gifts. I, it's my favorite animal. I have a I have one sitting right beside me. Wait, do you um did so you you have now opened your raccoon figurine? Yeah, I have a raccoon okay. stuffed animal sitting right beside me. It's my, my childhood. Well, then, then, I, then I'm sure you will find um, a lot. I, I hope that our, our tanuki uh, brings you a lot of happiness as you take it back to your own island. We have, we, of course, we have okay. one on the back of the on the back of the set there. Um, and, uh, yeah. Jordan, Jordan, did you did you also receive your yeah. raccoon figurine? Yeah, I have my raccoon figurine, but it's not letting me use it. But maybe. It's just no, no, you, you you can't you can't use it because Animal Crossing has a lot of restrictions about that sort of thing. Um, Hugh, Hugh's come to Hugh's come around the back of the desk here to like really make his uh, his gratitude known, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, please, please take that back to your island with our compliments. Um, before we before we blow off the party poppers here, and before we raid at the end of the show, uh, I would like to invite you both to uh, step up over here to the microphone uh, and uh, tell us. Um, a joke and just give me a moment here because what we do now on the show is we uh we rate these jokes based on um on uh, uh on um on comedy level you know all kinds it's like the olympics you know you show you show the uh, you show up the the cards you know six out of 6.0 and stuff like that but we have, here we do it via uh twitter poll and i'm gonna write in here the the the, 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 the poll is gonna be jordan's joke thumbs up or thumbs down and you're gonna have an opportunity to vote on that joke uh, in just a moment. First of all, I'm going to ask. Let me just step over here so we can get the camera on him. Right here we go. Uh, Jordan, the, the the floor is yours. Please tell us a joke. First, can everybody see my wonderful outfit? Yes. It's, well, yes. I love the cardigan. What do you call an alligator in a vest? I don't know. What do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator. <laughs> <laughs> the poll is up. The poll is up. Jordan's joke. Thumbs up or thumbs down. I I invite you. Uh, to to vote on that now. If you go, if you look at the top in the top left of the chat area, you're going to see a little poll. Um, and right now, let me tell you, the vote, the, the verdict is already in. That's, that's a good joke, and I know it's coming from me, so I would vote for that. The joke verdict is already in. Nine, right now, thumbs up, ninety-seven percent, ninety-six percent, thumbs down, four percent. Jordan, you absolutely killed it. Congratulations. Wow. I would alter the vest. <laughs> um adam can you fill for a bit i need one more minute. uh yeah hang on here we go vamp just vamp yeah play some music let's go let's go let's go check out adam while he plays some music hold on i just want to let you know he is trying to get by me because he's going for i know everyone's in my way jordan you get by me i'll go this way okay adam yeah let me drop let, let me kill the yeah, adam get on the drums i'm gonna drop the lights and make you look awesome there we go Perfect. Can we screen can we screen cap me being in the chair? Hey, what did I say about sitting in the host chair? <laughs> what did I say about that? That is strictly verboten around here. Do you like, like this song? I can do this. I want to interview you about making this show someday. Are you, you know what, Hugh? If you ever want to come on as like a guest host, you'll be very welcome. Okay, yeah, you, right. you go on vacation and I'll take over for a week. Okay, the results are in. Jordan's joke, 94% to six percent absolutely killed it congratulations so, so hugh tough act to follow let me just queue up your Ooh. poll here uh hugh's my joke. goodness uh, are we out of time nope I got, I, I got all the time in the world for you hugh to tell a joke and we're gonna oh, trust boy. me the audience is gonna, there's a very friendly crowd everyone's gonna love you uh we're gonna make this just a one minute poll because we really don't need that much time uh i'm gonna i'm gonna get you queued up here on the 
Hold on, I'm gonna get you queued up on the on the camera. Uh, let's see, let's make sure we can see you. Um, the audience is waiting. Hugh, please take it away with your joke. Okay, I'm gonna tell a Star Wars joke since it's May the 4th. Oh, all right, let's hear it. So, Obi-Wan Kenobi takes Luke to go get Asian food for the first time. Luke is making a mess of his food. He's just having a hard time with the chopsticks. There's food going everywhere. Obi-Wan is losing his cool, and he finally looks at Luke and says, Use the forks, Luke. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> the poll, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to say the poll is up. The poll is up. Oh, and, and the trends are down. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, the, and the, and the early voting is not good, but hold on. You can still turn this around. You've got a minute to turn this around. Uh, some people oh. uh, ra rallying a little bit. 42, 58. Rallying a little bit. 49. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, Hugh. 50. Wait, wait. wait. You're making a late rally. 54 46. What, how, how, what is going on? How are people laughing at this joke? <laughs> 52 48. This is, it's on a knife What's edge. the audio 51, going through correctly? 50, it's, it's now 50 50. Look at this. 51. Oh my God. Look at this. this is such I never, this drama that's going on right now. With it, uh, oh my God. Which way is this going to go? Look at this. With seconds to go, it's, it's split. 55 56 55. Oh my God. Look at this drama. 57 oh 57. My goodness. Oh my it, oh, it they, 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 at the last second! At the last second! 58 votes up. to 57. You oh, just thank you. Barely that, that made it. Now, I'm gonna, do, I, I'm gonna do something that I haven't done on... I'm gonna do something I haven't done on the show in a long time. I wanna do something I haven't done on the, long, on the show in a long time, because I don't feel like I've had a good one. I'm gonna tell a joke. Yay! I'll and I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna put myself... I'm gonna put myself out there. And I fully expect this one to go down in flames, just because it's me and no one... No one feels like they need to be nice to me because I'm the host. I get it. Are you uh, Googling jokes? No, I'm typing in the poll. Thank you very much. I know the joke. <laughs> I'm... I'm just going to shake. I'm going to shake my head the whole time. All right. Since you, it's, star, it's a Star Wars day, so as, as you said, so I'm going to tell a Star Wars joke. You ready? Yeah. All right. Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader are enjoying a family Christmas together. And Luke Skywalker says to Darth Vader, how did you know what I was getting for Christmas before I opened it? And Darth Vader said, I felt your presence. <laughs> <laughs> the poll is up. I love it. The poll is up. That's getting a thumbs up from me. I like but it. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, people are trolling me. There's no way that joke's not funny. All the thumbs down are just trolls. I know that. I get How do that. I that. I want to thumbs down it too. So you go, you go to the top of the chat and there should be a little box on the top left that will let you do that. 66.34. Yeah, I'm going to win this one, Adam. Adam, I don't want to leave you out. Do you want to tell a joke? Do you have any? I don't want to put you on the spot either, though. Totally I mistakenly voted thumbs up. I wanted to vote. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, they all count. They all count. I could do one. You want to do one? Yeah, like, why don't you go yeah. set up at the mic while uh, we do the, uh, while this poll, okay. poll finishes out. Mm, let's see if I got anything about, not about dairy again. It's going to be, yeah, all your jokes are weirdly milk related. I don't understand that at all. Like, you don't do non milk related humor. Uh, the votes are in. Well, no, it's 79, more dairy. Se, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me have my moment. 79 votes to 39 uh, votes. The official verdict of the chat is in. Wow. It's a funny joke. All right, Adam, let's hear it. Okay. I Well, I've been told by the chat no dairy jokes. And Does that limit my... you? Yeah, most of my content is dairy based, so I'm just gonna ignore the chat and go with a dairy joke. Uh, what do we got here? What? All right. What do you call cheese that isn't yours? Ooh. Uh, I feel like give me because I might. I feel like I know this one. Uh, oh, I know what it is. But you know what? I I know what it is, but I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm gonna let you deliver the punchline. Nacho cheese. <laughs> Pause up. Let's see where we are on this one. <laughs> Let's see where we are on this one. Oh, it's not going over well, Adam. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not been well received. So on, far, Chad. we've had three. We've had love three, my dairy-based humor. We've had three laughs uh, so far. Um, hold on. I've got to hold one of these puppets. So I get ready for the end of the show. Uh, yeah, it's going down in flames, Adam. Sorry. Oh, no. A uh, little bit random in chat says he should have told the other one. <laughs> Milk live, in this. Co live comedy, even from the chat. And Gong Zero says, that was not good enough. I agree. 
I agree. Is I've this just specifically because they asked me not to do dairy jokes? <laughs> um, no, I think it's just because it was bad. Oh, I see. <laughs> Uh, the poll's about to close. I'm going to ask... Oh, yeah, so the, yeah, the, vote, the votes are officially in. 75 votes uh, to 42. But hey, 42 people. Good sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, not, not popular. Um, so what I would like you to do now, we're, appro we're approaching the end of the show. Uh, so I'm going to mute the capture card here because we're about to run our end credits. Um... I just want to say before we before we before we close the show, um, thank you so much as always to uh, Adam, my band leader, and of course our guests Jordan Mechner um, and Hugh Howie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Also, of course, to my wife um, and executive producer Leah Witter and, and and all our moderators and everyone, everyone, especially of course you all at home watching this. Uh, we did this because we wanted to try and put a, a smile on people's faces uh, when everyone's stuck at home. And, and we're, we're, we're trying to do that every day we, we do the show. Um, next uh, show, Wednesday, um, is going to be uh, a very, very big show. Uh, we talked about it at the top of the show, but I'm going to mention it again. Probably the biggest guests we've had yet in terms of uh, celebrity. Um, I, Justine, legendary YouTuber. Uh, I, Justine is going to be here on Wednesday night. Mike Krahulik and Jerry Hawkins from Penny Arcade are going to be here Wednesday night. And Kind of Funny's Joey Noel uh, uh, is going to be here Friday night. It's going to be an absolutely packed, Wednesday packed night. show. A packed show. Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Pacific. Um, I spoke to Justine yesterday. Uh, she's excited to do it. She can't wait. She's a big Animal Crossing fan. Uh, and we're very excited to have her on here. And hopefully, Adam, give us some tips about, like, you know, how to, how, how to take this, this YouTube powder keg that we're sitting on right now and uh, make sure that it doesn't blow up in our faces. And oh, there's yeah, Joey exactly. and there's Joey in the chat. Very excited. Uh, hey, Joey's, like, Joey. Joey's going to be on the show Wednesday night, but she's actually in the chat right now. And that is just wonderful. I love that. I love that. So that's Wednesday night's show. And that's going to be very exciting. Um, but right now, it's time, it's time to wrap up. The way this is going to work, um, Jordan, what I need you to do, and because uh, you're the only one to do it, is go into your inventory, uh, pull out that party popper, and select hold. But don't put, and you're going to hold it. But the next time you press A is when you're actually going to pop it. And we like to try and get this all going off at once. So let's see if we can make this work. He's got it. He's got it. Oh, uh, actually, there hold we on, go. Hold on, hold on. I don't want to meet the capture card because I do want to hear it pop. Um, here we go. We're going to do this on three. Everyone's going to press A to blow off their party poppers. Then we're going to roll credits and then we're going to raid. So again, from everyone here uh, at Animal Talking, uh, for me, for Adam, for our guests, Jordan Meckner and Hugh Howie, thank you so much for joining us. It's really been a pleasure. You guys were, were great, great guests, and you're welcome back on the show anytime. <laughs> Yay! It worked. I love it when a plan comes together. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> I love it so much. I love it so much.